A space-time vortex around Earth, presented by Science at NASA. Would you believe Earth sits in the middle of a space-time vortex? Einstein predicted this almost a hundred years ago, and it turns out to be true. On May 4, 2011, researchers announced that NASA's Gravity Probe B spacecraft has detected the vortex, and its shape precisely matches the predictions of Einstein's theory of gravity. The space-time around Earth appears to be distorted, just as general relativity predicts, says Stanford University physicist Francis Everett, principal investigator of the Gravity Probe B mission. Time and space, according to Einstein's theories of relativity, are woven together, forming a four-dimensional fabric called space-time. The mass of Earth dimples this fabric, much like a person sitting in the middle of a trampoline. If Earth were stationary, that would be the end of the story. But our planet spins, and the spin should pull the dimple around in a four-dimensional swirl. This is what Gravity Probe B went into space in 2004 to check. The idea behind the experiment is simple. Imagine trying to spin a toy top on the dimpled surface of that trampoline. It's going to wobble, right? Something similar happens when you try to spin a gyroscope in curved space-time. Its spin axis will drift, or precess. Gravity Probe B carried some super-spherical gyros into Earth's orbit to see what they would do. In practice, this simple idea is extremely difficult. According to calculations, the twisted space-time around Earth should cause the axis of the gyros to drift by a tiny amount. Really tiny. It's like measuring the thickness of a sheet of paper held edge-on 100 miles away. Even the slightest disturbance could ruin the experiment. We had to invent whole new technologies to make this possible, says Everett. The Gravity Probe B team developed a drag-free satellite that could brush against Earth's atmosphere without disturbing the gyros. They figured out how to keep Earth's magnetic field from penetrating the spacecraft. And they created a device to measure the spin of a gyro without touching the gyro. Pulling off the experiment was a big challenge. But after a year of data taking and nearly five years of analysis, the Gravity Probe B scientists appear to have done it. The gyros processed, the vortex is real, and we are in it. Einstein was right again. For more information about the space-time vortex and what it means to us on Earth, please visit science.nasa.gov. Well, hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and this is the 129th Global Star Party peering in, into uh, time, or, uh, you know, to, um, in other words, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the look back time that astronomers uh, understand when we look at something that's far away. Um, and so we're going to have lots of different conversations about that. Uh, it's obvious to uh, many people when they understand the concept of a uh, light year, how far light travels in one year, and that distance is roughly 5.9 trillion miles, which is a boggling number. Um, uh, it's, it's easy to understand that if we're looking at a star that's four or five light years away, that we're seeing it as it was four or five years ago. When you see a galaxy that's 50 million light years away, we're seeing that galaxy as it was 50 million years ago. But I also challenge people to understand that 
uh, if you have your friend standing right in front of you, that just the briefest fraction of a go, okay, that, that the light had to travel to, to reflect off them and get to you, well, you're also seeing them in, in the past, okay? So we never get to see anything quite in real time. And so that is a, uh, uh, I guess that's one of the mind bogglers of uh, understanding and learning about uh, astronomy. And so um, tonight we have uh, great speakers, as we always do on Global Star Party. Uh, we have uh, David Levy, David Eicher, Terry Mann, um, Robert Wilmore. Robert hasn't been on our show in a while. Uh, he does uh, public outreach work and uh, very passionate about the uh, astronomy work that he does. Uh, uh, we have um, Tim Hunter. Uh, Tim is co-founder of the International Dark Sky Association and has written some books recently, which he's going to uh, cover tonight in the Bunard Objects. Cesar Brello will be on, Adrian Bradley, uh, Marcello Souza, uh, these are all regulars. Ron Breacher, who is becoming a regular, an astrophotographer, uh, comes back on to this 129th Global Star Party. And then we have John Schwartz, and he's introducing a friend who, um, who does astrophotography and teaches astrophotography. His name is uh, Mirko Mayer, and so we're real happy to have all these people on tonight. Um, and we're going to start with David Levy. Now, David, uh, David's internet was down, but uh, undaunted, David is joining us uh, by FaceTime on my, on my, on my uh, iPhone here. And so we're going to let David kick off the event by reading uh, some poetry into my, my microphone here. Go ahead, David. Well, thanks, Scotty. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, I am, uh, uh, we're talking about time. <clears throat> and I've got a couple of quotations tonight that to offer you that relate to the theme of time. And the first one is from Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth. And he, um, he is just the part in the play near the end where Macbeth is told that his wife, Lady Macbeth, has just died. And Macbeth at that point decides that he is going to uh, give up. He doesn't want to live anymore. He says, I have lived long enough. And he's just, uh, he's just giving up. <clears throat> Shakespeare, meantime, is trying to write a proper speech for him. And I like to think that as he's sitting down with his with his quill pen laptop and trying to write the speech that it's not working out for him and that he's just uh, throwing paper after paper. And finally there's a uh, knock on his, on, on his back and he turns around and there is God, the Almighty, standing right behind him. And God says, Will, take a break. Get a beer, get a cup of coffee. I think God so this is the first of the two quotations. She should have died hereafter. There, were, there would have been a time for such a word. And at the end of it, we, we realize how, how this connects to the theme of time tonight, where we believe that Shakespeare is anticipating by three centuries general relativity. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour across the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, signifying everything. And uh, this is where I think that that passage is so important, and possibly anticipating general relativity. The other quotation was inspired last night when David Rossiter and I were observing at the uh, Chiricola site, and we uh, were looking at Bada's window and the two globular clusters in there that are probably approximately 30,000 light years away, about one of the most distant clusters we can see. We're seeing them as they appeared some 30,000 years ago. 
And so this is a rewrite of John Keats's poem about the, um, you know, um, um, the famous line, and felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his kin. So I did a little bit of rewriting. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly stars and clusters seen. Round all the celestial islands have I been with eyepiece on telescope to the night sky hold. Oft of one white expanse had I been told that Galileo ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe as pure serene till I heard Walter Botta speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new star cluster swims into his king. Through his majestic window looks upon the Milky Way he stared at the center of our galaxy, like a diamond shining in the sky, with a wild surmise, silent through the mists of space and time. I hope you all heard that. Back to you, Scotty. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they did hear it. Thank you. They said it was like picture in picture here. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. And David, thank you very much. And um, you have a great night tonight. Thanks, and I hope I'll be back next week on Zoom. I'm sure you will. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. All right. So we have the technology. That's awesome. Um, uh, David uh, uh, always finds a way uh, to uh, make his uh, lectures work. Um, I, after seeing him at uh, the Astronomical League convention, um, you know, here he was, uh, obviously, uh, not in the best of health, but he he made it happen. He made it work, and uh, I I think it was. Uh, I mean, he got a standing ovation. It was ins inspirational, really, and um, so he is a driven person, and uh, we are lucky to to have him uh, with us. So, anyhow, um, let's uh, let's uh, move on to our next speaker here, which I believe is uh, David Eicher, and David uh, has been um, uh, finding the unusual uh, deep space objects to talk about. Um, now, David, uh, I'm not real familiar with uh, the Sharpless catalog. Who was Sharpless? Stuart Sharpless was an astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory in good old Flagstaff, uh, for many years, and he compiled a catalog of what were then considered to be very faint nebulae um, in the 1950s. And he revised it and, and expanded it to become a catalog uh, in its, its uh, second form, if you will, of 313 mm -hmm. objects. And so that's why when we see Sharpless 2 hyphen something or other, that means it's the first revision, second Sharpless catalog. Uh, and this we're going to be talking about is the 157th object that he listed in that second revision of the 313. So he was a very determined and, and an important uh, galactic astronomer researcher who compiled this catalog of great nebulae, most of them emission nebulae, um, that had been uh, essentially uh, unseen, many of them in earlier catalogs like the Messier and many of the NGC objects. I think you would probably love your series of exotic deep sky objects, David. So Well, thank you. Well, he was another guy who, like me, was afflicted with a strange disease of being really interested in these faint deep sky objects. And, and you're joined to, by a bunch of us that are afflicted. <laughs> well, well, thank. I'm glad to hear that, Scott. You know, sharing the the same uh, illnesses is is a good thing that that brings it out our humanity. I, I would say in many ways. And I do want to share tonight a a bit of a sad fact in space time, because you're seeing me now as I was a, a, a short time ago. And I don't even look this good anymore. <laughs> so that's kind of the pathetic nature of where we are with the universe. Here's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. But that, that notwithstanding, I would like to share uh, some information about one of these wonderful nebulae. So I will see if I can share my screen and I will see if I can share the right screen. 
and I will see if I can start a slideshow. And if you see Centaurus A there, we're yeah. in the right place in space and time. All looks uh, good. And I will. All right, can looks you see good? It looks good. That's a good looking galaxy. There's maybe, you know, what Milkomeda will look like, you know, 7 billion years from now, but we won't be around to see it, but we can dream. Um, but moving on to what we're really here for tonight is Stuart Sharpless and his catalog, as we mentioned. Uh, this is Sharpless 2 uh, 157. Um, if you're keeping track at home, it's a large and relatively bright emission nebula. Most of the Sharpless objects are emission uh, or reflection nebulae. This is in Cassiopeia. And the nice surprise here tonight, we're moving slowly through a list of several. Scott realizes how terrible this is, what I'm planning. But <laughs> we're moving through a list of hundreds of deep sky objects. Okay. So... You know, if I live that yeah. long, I may be, you may be stuck with me for another 10 years talking about it. But, but um, anyway, we've moved about a degree away from where we were last week. That's the progress we're making here. Because this uh, object that's sometimes called the lobster claw, you might have heard of it in that way. Remember, in the last 20 years or so, amateur astronomers have come up with a nickname for essentially everything in the sky, you know, with time on their hands. Um, but this is very close to the bubble nebula, which we talked about last week, that's a much brighter uh, emission nebula, of course, with a, a very hot wolf Rye star uh, embedded in it. So this one is fainter and it's larger and it's, it, it is shaped sort of somewhat claw-like. I will, I will accede to that tonight. It also has a number of objects that are uh, in very close proximity, as you'll see to this Nebula and uh, the most prominent are two pretty bright open clusters, Markarian 50. Uh, Markarian's another one of these great deep sky researchers. He was an Armenian, um, and and th this is a an open. He studied largely open clusters and galaxies. This open cluster is about 11,000 light years away. So in in accordance with our theme tonight, we're seeing this open cluster and the associated nebula at about a distance of 11,000 light years. That's as, as they were about 11,000 years ago. Um, it's near the northern edge of the nebula, and there's a brighter cluster that it's more likely that you're familiar with, and that is NGC 7510. It's compact, but has a bunch of bright stars in it in a kind of a distinctive shape. And it's an eighth magnitude cluster overall. It's about seven arc minutes across. It's also 11,000 light years away. And these are both young clusters that were born out of this hydrogen gas. So they're a uh, tick under 8 million and, and 10 million years old, relatively young open clusters. The northern part of this nebula, uh, which is sometimes separately identified, by the way, is Sharpless 2157A, if you're scoring at home. Um, and if you are, then we need to get you into some other hobbies too. Like remember the the the, the Packers are playing this weekend. Let's hear some good mojo for Green Bay, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, the northern part, it, it has its own uh, identification number here, and it somewhat like the Bubble Nebula, except on a smaller scale and a fainter uh, nebula and star, also has a Wolf Rye star embedded in it. Um, that's ionizing the, the gas in a circular shape. Remember, wolf Rye stars are, uh, are massive stars that, that are fairly young, that were stripped of their outer atmospheres and so have a very intense uh, ionizing radiation pressure that they're uh, pushing out into the surrounding interstellar medium. So this is a weird and interesting area of the Cassiopeia Milky Way. Here's the same chart that we looked at last week, just to prove that I'm telling the truth. The bubble nebula is in the middle here, and our large um, Sharpless 2157 is below it here, which has this weird kind of claw-like shape. And you can see the clusters near it, uh, including uh, the fairly bright NGC 7510. So this is a wide field uh, image that I found on the internet by Trevor Jones that shows the lobster claw at the bottom. You can see this sort of claw-like uh, appendage going up from the nebula. 
The bubble nebula is the brighter nebula, smaller nebula that's above it, just above center. The bright uh, nebula, which maybe we'll also talk about one of these days, NGC 7538 is off to the right of the bubble there. And the big open cluster, M52, is up near the top of this image. The bright cluster that I'm talking about that's near the lobster claw is just to the right of the lobster claw there and is a small, compact, fairly bright, uh, kind of linear shaped open cluster there. And we'll see it in more detail in a, in a minute here. Here's a uh, better shot in terms of detail um, of the lobster claw, um, Sharpless 2-157. NGC 7510 here is just at the bottom right edge there. You can see that bright open cluster. Uh, and the circular area with a bright wolf Rye star is just to the left of center there, you can see. Mm -hmm. So here is NGC 7510 that if you're frustrated and you don't have a reasonably large scope in a dark sky to see the lobster claw itself, so relatively low surface brightness. These are generally all challenging objects. So one of your guys with your 18 and 25 inch scopes will be able to see it. But if you have a smaller telescope, you'll certainly be able to see the open cluster of GC 7510. This is a good and detailed shot of it by our old pal, uh, Bernhard Hubel. So that's it. That's the challenge object. We're almost done with that area now after two weeks. And uh, we're still drop by and enjoy us and drop us a line and send us your images. We're enjoying the anniversary year of Astronomy Magazine. I'll quickly mention again that the latest book that's out there is uh, our child's introduction to space exploration that I wrote with Michael Bakich. And please keep on your radar, if you would, Starmus 7, the seventh Starmus Festival we're going to hold next spring, fortunately several weeks after the eclipse, in Bratislava, Slovakia, that really is just a hop, skip, and a jump from Vienna, Austria. That's an easy place for Westerners even to get to. So we will have many fun things to announce in the near future with Starmus. And that's what I have, Scott, tonight. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, seeing more of, um, of Astronomy Magazine's 50th anniversary year and the highlights that you guys will have. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you schooling me on Sharpless. So I'm going to have to dive into his, uh, his catalogs and learn more about the man. So. He was a good guy, and, and that's one of the more interesting catalogs. There are a lot of obscure catalogs of deep sky objects, but this is a good one as far as amateurs are concerned. Interesting things, and many of them are bright enough to go after to both view and certainly to image. So it's worth checking awesome. out. Yeah, awesome. Thanks very much, David. Okay. Thank you, Scott. All right. Uh, we are going to transition to... Uh, uh, Terry Mann. Terry is someone that has um, been a steward over uh, the Astronomical League for many years. Uh, she is, um, you know, her boundless energy in getting people organized and keeping everyone on track and, uh, you know, following through on big agendas that the Astronomical League has is, uh, is really impressive. And um, she is uh, also, I think, equally impressive. She's an adventurer. Uh, she uh, goes out to remote areas to go and photograph uh, aurora, uh, but she loves uh, nature. Um, you know, a lot of people say they like nature and all the rest of it, but uh, uh, Terry is special in this way, and um, so uh, we're lucky to have her on tonight. And uh, Terry, what have you got for us? Well, thank you, Scott. Um, you were talking about back in time, and I thought, you know, I kind of would like to take that to a different level a little bit. Okay. And so I'm going to share my screen. I want to go to long, long ago, but I want to go to long, long ago from the other end of the telescope to what we have seen change. And when we look back, what we, we have seen as amateur astronomers 
and imagers and visual people. So this is kind of everything I think so many of us will remember because uh, I came into astrophotography because I had a camera, I love photography, and I loved astronomy. The two went together. So I started off with putting a DSLR on the back of the RV6 criteria, Criterion, the reflector mm -hmm. telescope that I still have, that I bought used for $200. But nowadays, we have all graduated. The technology has just really blossomed and moved forward so far. But you know, one of the big things for me was when I first started being interested in astronomy, putting a camera on the telescope, I started looking around at people that were imaging. And the guy that impressed me the most was Jack Newton. I, I looked at his work and it, it just, I was just so enthralled by everything he did. He inspired me to do what I do. He inspired me to image. He inspired me to reach, reach more, to try to be better. And I, while I have never been as good as Jack Newton even is today, it, is, it goes to show that we as amateurs, when we work and we talk to other people, we never know who we're inspiring or what they might do. So, you know, for all of you out there doing that, realize you might be touching somebody that they have no idea. I mean, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet Jack at one time, and I think I told him, wow, I bought your first book. I think it was his first book. And it just really inspired me to do this. So realize a lot of you out there are doing the same thing and you just might not know it yet. And as I said, this was my first, I called this my real telescope. I had the 60 millimeter uh, telescope, but this was my real telescope. And I still have the tube and I'm sure in the garage somewhere that old mount is still there. But, you know, the thing was, I was interested in astronomy. I bought a telescope and it was all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I know the constellations. But I don't know anything else. Now, how do I how do I use this? How do I learn? My parents didn't know anything about it. So I had to learn and they did help me. I had to learn actually how to use it, what the sky, what was in the sky. How do I look through this things? And I've seen some of the articles where uh, the ads, especially for the cigarettes, I saw one where the eyepiece was down at the other end and they were kind of looking at their belly button. And you know, if you didn't know any better, you might do the same thing or a beginner might do the same thing. But you know what really confused me? When I talked to people and I'd say, I want to do photography, the first one of the first things they said was you have to have a drive. But they said, you have to polar align. And I said, what? What is polar align? And they said, oh, you got to line the axis up with the North Star. Well, I knew where the North Star was, but oh my gosh, look at this. How, how am I supposed to know how exactly to align a mount like this. This is how, where I started and I was confused. I didn't know what to do, but look at today. Today is amazing. We have so much technology to help us set a telescope up, align a telescope, guide a telescope. The new mounts have made an incredible difference for everything we do. And they're all just totally amazing. And like I said, I, I loved photography. This was my first, this was my camera. And I bet a lot of people out there used a Pentax K1000 at one time. When I first started doing the Aurora, always, I always used film in the very beginning. And I either used the ISO 400 or the film 1600. Um, I also hypered film why, two or three times, but I was worried I was going to blow the house up. So I uh, kind of backed away from that. But you know, it, you took pictures and then you had to get them developed and you spent all this money and you were lucky if you had one or two good pictures on that roll of film. And then you had all that money that was wasted, but you did learn from it. But the one thing I really, I learned about cameras, this was all manual. I learned to understand aperture, ISO, everything that went along with this focusing, so when I advanced on up to a, a dedicated astro camera, I knew a little bit more about it because I understood how the camera works. 
with these, we have instant gratification. Whatever we shoot, we see right away, which is a big plus, a huge plus. Uh, hey, as with any digital camera, the image isn't any good. Hey, no problem. Throw it away. De you know, delete it. Do whatever. That's no problem. But you learn from what went wrong on that image. On using software, um, I, you know, I've gotten used just like everybody else. I use a lot of software, but uh, there is always a learning curve that is going to go with that. But I also, in the beginning, I set up my own darkroom. Mm. So I learned the mechanics behind what the image was. I knew all this because I was back in a time when we did not have this technology, all these new technologies, which it's great either way. And I, you know, I envy the people that don't go through this, but I really did learn a lot about developing. Uh, the one thing I hated, oh my gosh, the chemical smell, that would almost make me sick. And you had to work, every, everything was time sensitive. You know, here so long, there so long. Uh, hang the picture up, look and see what we've got. But yet, I have to admit, I enjoyed it. In college, I did all the darkroom classes that I could and all the photography. I really learned a lot about that. But nowadays, I got to admit, I love the digital darkroom. It is so nice to sit down and really think about what my eye saw what I saw that night and how to make that image look like it almost as much like it as I could make the image look through the digital darkroom. Because when they developed my pictures at um, the store, they would tell me that they don't have, they didn't have a lot of control as, as I knew. Sometimes you just really could not control that. With a digital darkroom, I can control so much more of the print. And I think that's where, you know, is it art or is it, really, you know, the image you saw. And there's always going to be that counterbalance there. Some people pr prefer what they actually saw. Others like the art end of it. And that's cool too. You know, as long as you're not trying to pass it off as something else. The, oh, the AI software anymore, the software is amazing. Uh, there is so much incredible software out there. Mm. The learning curve comes with it too. I started PixInsight and I've got a learning curve with that. Um, I use a lot of Topaz Lab. I use that. Um, but it is amazing what it can do to help you put the picture, the image, back to look like what it was you took. So, you know, going from the smell and setting up the dark room, the lights, to being able to roll into a room, have a beer and a piece of pizza while you're processing your prints. Total different atmosphere. Totally. It's still the same basics behind it in some ways, you know but we don't have to put up with the chemicals. We can do so much more and be so much more comfortable. And polar alignment, I have to admit, I use the ASI Air. Um, that I have really gotten used to. And when I go to super, I know where the North Star is, but when I'm standing on my head, trying to look through the polar aligning scope on a mount, it's very easy for me to get confused when there's a whole lot more stars there. So I use the ASI Air, and there are many more other things that you can use, too. You've got Nina, you've got PhD2, you've got a lot of things that you can learn, that you can use for guiding, polar alignment, um, you know, everything. And we are so lucky to have that, because polar alignment for me, as you saw what I started with, it really was an issue how to do it. And the darker skies I go to, you know, the harder time it was to pull that little North Star out of all these stars in the field. And the new the new technology helps me do that. And I'm sure it helps a lot of other people, too. And we all have our favorite things that we do and favorite gear that we use. But we have really came a long, long way. Oh, yeah. Solar filters. Now, we've got eclipses coming up, a lot of solar stuff coming up. We know how important solar filters are for the safety of our eyes. You know, we have got to have safe filters up there. Think back, my little 60 millimeter Sears refractor. I remember being in grade school and I was so excited because I could bring my refractor to school and show all my classmates the sun. Why well, had this little screw in? solar filter for my eyepiece on that 60 millimeter refractor pointed at the sun probably for at least a half hour. Can you imagine what would have happened if this thing would have cracked? 
I mean, it is amazing. Again, we spartaned up. We have learned a lot. Technology's taken a lot. But how many, I bet there's quite a few people that had that solar filter come with a telescope. And I've heard horror rumors that some people have still seen this come with a telescope, which is just unbelievable to me. Um, that's something that should have been outlawed from the very beginning. But I can still remember being so proud of that 60 millimeter refractor and that little solar filter. And now it's just a piece of history that we wanna forget. Guiding, oh my gosh, I hate to tell you how many hours with an illuminated reticle on a guide scope that I spent in the observatory taking pictures, especially of Orion. I remember Orion one night. Oh, it, my eye was practically frozen to the, to the reticle or to the eyepiece. But nowadays, look at this. Man, we can take a 30 millimeter guide scope and throw on, this is a 120 ZWO mini guide and it will, guide, it will just guide away. We don't have to strain our eyes. You know, we look back at how, what our roots were. I mean, this is definitely what our roots were and what we're using today has made everything so much easier. It's just incredible. And so the, to today, um, star trackers, there's a whole bunch we could say about star trackers. I use a GTI go-to um, because I when I started off with a uh, Skyguider Pro and I loved it, but I spent so much time trying to find the objects. The GTI uh, with the go-to has been incredible. And I have also got the EQ6R Pro that I really enjoy working with. And, you know, they tell me now I have to pull their line. I press the button, I look and just go. And that's something that long ago we didn't, we weren't able to do. So we have came so, so far in history and are in our roots of how we did things and how things worked. Um, and so it, we got to, we spend more incredible time under the stars where I start up my gear a lot of times and I just kick back and watch the sky. I can watch it on the iPad, guiding or the phone, and I can watch the sky, I can watch a meteor shower. You know, that's stuff that we really could not do in the past. But okay, what about you guys? I mean, a camera and a tripod is amazing. It really is. Um, there are so many new cameras that do great, can allow you to do great nightscape photography. And, you know, I found the more I've worked with stuff like this, people can relate to things that they see, whoops, I'm sorry, see in the sky. Um, because I can have a picture of a galaxy on an art display and they're not real, really impressed with the galaxy, but you show them the moon and they can, they relate to those craters. They relate to everything else that you see on there. Um, Aurora, people can relate to that. A lot of wide field with the earth in that field or in that image really makes people stop and think. And it's easy to do. It is very easy to do. You always experiment some. And you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive camera. You can work with what you got. Experiment with what you have and do what you can. And you will learn from that. And it will be fun. And it will be easy because you don't have to lug a lot of equipment around. You take the camera, you take the tripod out, and you look around and you, you stop and really think about what kind of image you want. So start there. That's what most of us did. We worked with a camera. We worked with a tripod. We understood the basics. And that is very important to do. And Scott, I think that is all I have for you okay, tonight. It was very thorough. I think Thank that you. it's nice to uh, go down memory lane a little bit. And um, uh, certainly I remember some of the challenges of, uh, of being working with film and stuff like that. But that, that craft of working in the dark room is something a lot of us miss. Uh, but I'll tell you what I don't miss about the dark room. And I worked in the dark room many, many years is the uh, stained clothes. All your clothes would be stained. <laughs> yeah. From, from oh, yeah. Chemistry and stuff as you're moving with the prints and the trays and stuff sloshing around and stuff like that. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. But uh, yeah, when you came out with a beautiful result, uh, you know, it was really, oh. it was very nice. But I would say that the, in the digital era that we have more control than we did then. And yeah. the other part is, is that 
um, when we're working with an image, we're always working with an original and you're yeah. transferring something that's largely an original digital file. So, you know, this allows you to uh, uh, do high quality science work, you know, and yeah, it um, it's already yeah. archival, you know, and yeah. um, it can be transferred anywhere in the world in the blink of an eye, pretty much. So, yeah, and you can play with that. You know, I go back sometimes and I look at some of my older work and then I can update it, you know, with the newer technology, with the newer software, I can make it look like I want it to look or like I think I remember it looked better you know right. it just allows you to do so much more and so we've learned so much as we've moved along and I think it's great and I can't wait to see what else we learn in the future oh, yeah in the future in the future yeah. you know the as you say the software just gets better and better and our skill set gets better and better so yes it too. does it definitely does yep yeah. We were talking with chatting with the audience a little bit um, and uh, we were as you were talking about uh, going down memory lane in the dark room uh, Mike Wiesner brought up um, you know how he remembered some of the old telescope companies like Criterion and Unitron and uh, Starliner and optical craftsman and stuff oh, and yeah. I felt very privileged to actually kind of have known that prior generation of telescope makers you know so oh yeah they did cool. incredible jobs i mean for the time it they was did. they did incredible work yeah yeah i mean the sure. optics of my little rv6 are amazing to me so right that's right yeah. i just Mike couldn't bring my, my parents my parents could afford to get me a unitron or any of those really nice telescopes i saw in sky and telescopes so at christmas in 1961 my mom got me an Edmund Scientific three-inch Newtonian telescope for thirty dollars. Oh wow! Pretty good deal. Yeah, real good deal. <laughs> oh, Mike says should have been could not have afforded. <laughs> that would have been my case too. So, anyways, yeah. But here we are now, uh, working with uh, really great equipment all the time, and um, I would tell you that. Uh, uh, the telescope makers today are all doing a great job, you know, so it's yeah. it's really interesting to be in this industry. Terry, yeah. thank you so much. And thank uh, you, Scott. I want to thank the Astronomical League for all the stuff that they do. Um, and uh, let's talk maybe before I let you go, let's talk about the next Alcon. That's yeah. That coming up yeah. Kansas We're going to be going to Kansas City. Yes, we don't have the dates are not set yet. The host club is working okay. on that now. So we will be in Kansas City, probably, I'm going to guess sometime in July is what I think they're going to come up with some date in July. Okay. So yeah, that, that will be a lot of fun. Great. Okay. Well, as it gets closer to that, we'll, we'll talk more about the details. So that's great. And, and that um, sounds good too. Um, one thing I do want to bring up, um, if AL Live is going to happen on September 22nd, Robert Reeves is going to be on and he will speak. All right about observing and understanding the moon so awesome. we're looking forward to that that'll be at 7 p.m edt september 22nd september 22nd all right that's great i, hey, I thank think you, i'll Scott. be there so yeah <laughs> you better be <laughs> thanks since i'm broadcasting it yeah. great okay all right well thank you very much terry and thanks, uh, have a good night you thanks too so yep okay all right so um uh, gentleman, I had mentioned earlier uh, that had been on Global Star Party before, uh, but it's been a little while, is Robert Wilmore. Robert is an outreach enthusiast um, and a uh, very creative kind of guy, which is uh, uh, exciting because, um, you know, to have someone approach uh, learning about astronomy and explaining, uh, uh, you know, the concepts of astronomy in a fresh way is I think really exciting. So, Robert, uh, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party, and um, I'm going to give you the stage. Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, first, can you hear me? Let's double check you. that. Perfect. Five by five. Okay, cool. All right. I hear I hear it. Sorry, I have a little bit of a delay going on here. But all right. So on my screen here, oh, I think I can start to see it now. I see the sun starting to come back. Now, 
this is what basically I consider outreach astronomy. What, what is outreach astronomy is something you might be curious about. It's uh, what I'm trying to do here is share telescopes with everybody conveniently. And there are many different ways to do it, but why would you want to do this? You know, you might be asking yourself is that, um, well, really, I just think that outreach is a great way to meet people. Uh, you are literally using the stars to break the ice. There is no need for drinks music or dancing or to have fun. Uh, although those things can add to the, the fun that outreach provides. Indeed, outreach doesn't uh, just, it allows you to get to those really far out conversations that you would typically have with people after the third drink or the third round of records that you're listening to or uh, the third round of dancing. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun doing those things, but I'm not sure if we could actually enjoy any of those things without someone going out there and sharing astronomy and teaching about it. So it's just a really good way to connect with other people uh, on an astronomical level with your community and uh, build long lasting friendships that would, with, with people that you would never otherwise consider having anything in common with. So that's what uh, outreach is for me. It's just a great way to connect with people. And I have a ton of tips that I have about to go over here with you. And uh, I'll try to see if you have any questions, but I'm just gonna just start rambling just, just yeah, to get, well, let you know. All right. First, so, off, um, Robert, I, first, I have a question so here is the you. sun that we were trying to show you here. Okay. You can see kind of an edge here and maybe a solar prominence might show up here at the top. Oh, cool. I see some clouds clearing up right now. Sure enough, the clouds do show up right when you try and start sharing your telescope, that will happen. All right, so, um, <clears throat> If you want to go out there, my, my first tip for public astronomy is if you want to go out there and share your telescopes with people, it's really important to just know your gear, I think. It's uh, useful to know what telescope you're using, how to use it, all the nuances about it. You don't want to be out there trying to figure out your telescope while sharing it with people. That might add to the frustration. And if you start to show that you're frustrated, you don't really know how to use your telescope, this might deter people from wanting to buy one. So uh, yeah, do your best to know your telescope, but as well as know a few things to aim at as well. Maybe the stars um, are not your strong point. You might not know every constellation in the sky and that's okay because doing public outreach, you're gonna learn a lot about astronomy and uh, people will just tell you things. However, if you know where the moon is or the planets, those are great things to start off with. That's what I would start off with. The sun is also useful if you know how to share it safely. Uh, but yeah, that's that for tip number one. And I just want to make sure that, yeah, you go over all your gear and, and be sure to get ready for lots of questions about your gear as well. And if you are going out there and sharing the moon or a specific planet, try to know some information about the object that you're about to share here. Me, I didn't prepare at all. So I've already failed my first tip. I, if we saw the solar flare, I wouldn't really be able to tell you all that much about it. Uh, I know that the sunspots that we might be able to see over here in this camera, oh, I can see, I can see a cloud coming through or some, some light. So this is, by the way, the white light filter on the right-hand side. And this is an H-alpha telescope here on the left. And there were some solar prominences here. But um, yeah, so I don't know all these solar features. I'm not very versed in it, but uh, I, I know a little bit and, and I can keep a conversation going. So that was my first tip. That's a big one. I'm sorry, that was a big tip, but we, we got plenty more to go over here. <clears throat> tip number two, okay, is to start off small. Try and share your telescopes with a smaller group if possible, uh, friends and family. That's the best way to start off. I start off with barbecues and uh, it, it just blew up from there. Okay, uh, let's let's move on actually. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this and I'm gonna show you my first telescope. Let's see. Number two. Okay, here we go. Here's my first telescope. It was a uh, 114 millimeter Newtonian. And Scott, we all get on questions? And so uh, no, this but, but telescope I, I, I started I, taking out and sharing with people at the docks. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And you can right. see how it- I have a comment. A um, covered in signatures, sorry, turn up my volume. Yep, I, Look at I that. There's comment. one of the first signatures. Oh, oh yeah. Comment. 
Yeah, I have a comment. Um, you know, you were talking about maybe not knowing everything that's up in the sky or, or knowing every answer. Uh, but, um, you know, it is, as you said, it's a learning process. And if you're getting out there and you're sharing the eyepiece or sharing the view and you're sharing the excitement, um, then uh, that takes people a long way. I agree. Yeah, sorry, I got delayed on the comment there. Uh, I totally agree, though. It, it really does push the uh, experience when you're just sharing it. So this is our setup here that you can see. And this is the solar telescope that we have set up right outside. This is the H-alpha telescope, and here's the white light telescope. All right. Now I want to share with you a quick time lapse. Come up here to my time lapse. All right, let's move on to the next couple tips while this is going on. So, uh, when when you're doing public astronomy, uh, try to practice speaking clearly and reiterating the same information in new ways. Oftentimes, you will be asked the same question repetitively from new visitors. It's important to never show impatience or that you're getting tired of being asked the same question over and over. Try to be excited about telling them the same information for the hundredth time that night. After all, the information is exciting and it's worth repeating hundreds of times. Uh, become the embodiment of science. That is, be a self-correcting process. Double check all the information that you provide is accurate to the best of your ability. If someone corrects you, take it with a stride uh, and vow to tell them the corrected information from now on, to tell others the corrected information from now on and, and be sure to also Triple check that information yourself, of course. And uh, next, lobotomize yourself. <clears throat> Try to become two separate people. One is going to help. The other is going to freak out after the show. This is a show, and the show must go on. If, ac if accidents happen, do your best to maintain composure. Continue to educate and freak out later. I have stories about kids trying to ride the telescope, hands twisting adjustment knobs, eye makeup all over beautiful eyepieces, signatures over signatures, and yes, one dude even tossed a pen at our mirror. Uh, but the show must go on. And also, this goes without saying, but uh, use robust, a uh, robust test, ah, but use a strong telescope, something that was built well, like our Explore Scientific 10-inch first light Dobsonian, because it's gonna get a beating over, this, over the, the, the years if you use it for that long and thousands of visitors. All right, now um, make sure to give your visitors a chance to handle the telescope every now and then if you can. Eventually, if you become comfortable enough around visitors, it's very helpful to let them put the hands, put their hands on the telescope. This is a serious step up in letting others enjoy your equipment. When you let someone aim and focus your telescope for the first time, you're basically creating an astronomer on the spot. And it can be an even more awesome experience for that visitor than just looking through it. Bring a donation jar, get a Venmo QR code if you can. People want, will wanna give you money. So try and streamline the process so you can keep yourself from being occupied by money transactions. Use a sign. Any dry erase board will do, and uh, it, the more official the sign looks, the more professional you will appear. People will be less hesitant when you have a sign. This is great uh, for people who are just shy and also for you if you are shy about uh, engaging with strangers. So also wear a reflective vest if you can. I don't have one with me, but usually as you can see in the time lapse as I'm out there, uh, people will run into your telescopes if you do not make their presence known. It just happens. So light up your telescope, keep it in a well-lit area if possible. All right. Next, uh, ask people if they've seen Saturn yet. Don't ask if they would like to. Instead, ask if they've had a chance yet. This will seem more like a, a public service than just someone soliciting for money. The people walking by might be confused at first, thinking they unintentionally walked into an invite-only session, but nine out of 10 people will not argue and just be jealous that they haven't received their free view yet. The other one-tenth of the people will say, wait, you can see Saturn? And then they'll want to have a come look, they'll want to have a look after that. So um, also, uh, if people are in a hurry, just uh, they, they will let you know. Um, don't be afraid to wave someone down who looks like they're on a mission. Oftentimes, they'll politely let you know. And 
uh, keep moving if they're too busy. And if you're too shy to interact with them, they might just move on regardless. This brings us to the next one and get used to rejection because it does happen. Not everyone wants to look through your telescope and that's fine. Try to remember who they are so you make sure not to bother them again if you can. Let's see, I have another video here. I'm gonna go. Let me get another video going real quick while we go over some more tips, if you don't mind. And uh, yeah, just get used to the rejection. Um, Wish uh, them a good evening if they don't want to look through your telescope. And the person who just rejected you will likely be more thankful the sooner you move on to your you move on your attention from them. So be quick, be polite, don't drag on the process, and smile. Uh, that's my next tip. Uh, after all, you are having fun, so why not? Let your emotions show. If you see a spectacular view of the moon, put out the energy you hope to expect others to. Put out when they look through your telescope. If you love hearing people say, oh wow, that's so cool, then you should do it too. Uh, this will just make the whole experience more fun and it'll help you show others how fun really telescopes are. So uh, being stressed is okay so, so long as you keep it exciting. Um, and all right, let's move on actually to some other things. Uh, but one more tip, I've got lots more actually. Uh, explain everything you do if you can. Every time you change the eyepiece, add a filter or adjust anything, let the visitors know and, uh, what? Ooh, that was a cool, that was a cool signature I just saw, sorry. Um, yeah, it just fills the dead air as you explain things. And so there's no awkward silences and it also helps keep your visitors feel like they're more involved in the process. Yeah, I'm gonna turn up my volume. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna start getting up the next bit of media. And so now, I'm gonna see if the sun has come back actually. Let's take a quick look. Okay, no, it looks like it's still cloudy out there. Boo. Do that. And now, okay, I'm gonna bring up the next tip. Let's see. Tip number 14. We're on tip number 14. Okay, so. Yeah, you explain everything you do and, oh no, we moved on to that tip actually. But here, let me just show you a couple more things. Like as we were explaining everything you do, we, we showed you the sun and here are the telescopes that we're using. So that's sort of an example of that. Next, I would like to show you this. So my next tip for you outreachers is to try and, uh, if you can, bring some red towels small curtain, uh, block out any nearby lights if you can. Uh, you know, just to help with stray lights. Oh, all right. Now, if you can also be sure to let people know when you're going out. And this could be really helpful. Let me bring up this next one. I have uh, another tip for you all. I have a couple more tips, but I wanted to show you this, this cool news article here that we've got. Let me bring it over here. Check this out. We made it into the news, y'all. Boom. Wow. Okay. Great. So, uh, yeah, when you go out, it's nice to let people know that you're going out. It's also nice to notify the local authorities of what you're doing and when you're doing it, if possible. If there's security in the area, it's better to seek permission than forgiveness. Uh, practice using a cell phone. Here you can see that uh, this person's holding a cell phone photo that we just took. So, People will want to take photos through your telescope, and it's uh, going to take up some very precious time at the eyepiece. If you can, ask to take the cell phone from them and take the photo for them through your telescope. And with your practice, this will speed things along. Not only will they think you're a wizard, but they will be more grateful. Next, I would like to actually show you the, the posts that we do. So here's an example of a Reddit post. You can, if you want to, you can copy this from the screen and, and uh, plagiarize it all you want. Um, this will just allow people in your community to know where you are. And here we've posted on the Bellingham subreddit of Reddit. And it was great. This is tripled the amount of visitors that we get. Next, I would like to show you, we're almost done here, just so you know. Tip number 19 is bring a buddy if you can. So right back there, that's my wife, Cheyenne. And, uh, 
it could be your grandparents, uh, a friend, a coworker, anyone. They don't even know, need to know how to use a telescope, but it's better if they do, obviously. Uh, if they want to bring their own telescope, that's even better. You know, you have double the telescopes to look at the sky with. But it's just safer to do these kinds of events with more numbers. If you have another person with you, this will help you when you get swarmed with guests. And so bring a buddy and uh, this will make the whole situation a whole lot safer for you. And we have two more tips and then we're done here. I'm gonna go ahead and close these. And next, I'm gonna move this over here. So we got that out of the way. And see, we explain everything that we do, right? As we go, and then I'm going to go up into my next menu here and start showing you some cool stickers. Now these are stickers try to uh, come up with something to give out to your members, your visitors as they come along. And sorry if I'm missing any questions right now. I'll get to those in a second. But uh, yeah, give out badges whenever you can um, or business cards. You can make it uh, anything, you know, photographs, just some sort of souvenir to remind people of what it was that they saw. You know, like I saw a galaxy, a globular cluster, a nebula, a planet, the moon, or I saw the sun safely. And uh, these are really fun. People will have a lot of big blasts with these. And the last tip that I've got here is to, if you want to, go ahead and let people sign your telescope. <laughs> this isn't every, something that everybody wants to do. It, it's going to boost the enjoyment of your visitors and the, sh the show in general by like 10 times. Uh, just make sure that they look through the telescope before you let them sign it. That's the rule. Eventually, your well-signed telescope will become a beacon of outreach, and it alone will attract visitors. It becomes a community art project in this way and lets visitors feel like they're part of something bigger. And here is the progression. Here we have the brand new Explore Scientific 10-inch Dobsonian I love this telescope for many reasons, and I could just do a whole thing on talking about this, why this is one of the best telescopes, I think, for public outreach. But then it gets a little bit more covered in signatures as it goes along, and then eventually it's completely covered. And we're going to donate this telescope as soon as we reach our donation goal of uh, $1,450, and we only have $450 left to go. We've been doing this since February. That's it. That's my presentation, y'all. Thanks for uh, taking in all my tips about space. Yeah. Here's the view of the sun. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, there's a story here. Uh, Steve Adkins was telling a story about um, uh, a public outreach thing that he was doing during Comet Hayakataki. He says, a long time ago, I was doing a public event for Comet Hayakataki, and the local news was there to do an interview. I ran to the car to get some notes and slammed my thumb in the car door. I carried on. <laughs> That's a brave man right Ooh. there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the show must go on, as you say. Uh, that's great. I love the idea that you have people sign your telescope, Robert. Uh, I agree. It does totally. make it look very um, festive. And, uh, you know, uh, I had... I had done something uh, similar, not not quite as cool as having somebody sign my telescope, but um, I would have them sign my star chart. And so I have a star chart with all these signatures from other amateur astronomers, people that I just met, newbies, astronauts, uh, you know, space explorers. Um, so it's got the full gambit in there. And uh, but that's beautiful. I, I really love it. I like all the colors on it. And it looks cool. Oh, I'll go grab it real quick. While he's getting that, um, I did want to mention that, um, uh, you know, in October, uh, there will be um, signups for the upcoming winter star party. Uh, and the next big star party that I know about right now is the Okitex, which is happening this September. So if you're looking to go to dark skies, uh, see some cool stuff, um, and be with some great people, uh, these are two wonderful star parties to attend. I see Robert here setting up his 
his, uh, his sign telescope here. Okay, there it is. Let me uh, get this a little bit bigger. There we go. Very cool. Now, how long uh, have you been doing this, um, your outreach work? I, I put this knob on here to allow people to do it. Oh, 2017. 2017 is when you started. Okay. That's a good idea. Look at that. Very nice. I like to see people customize their telescopes. Here's a better here's use. Here's a boot. This thing. What does that do? It's a fan. This is a fan, and it also has a nice protective uh, grating on here to keep people from trying to mess with the collimation knobs. Ah, very good, excellent. Built-in battery. Excellent. All homemade, huh? Mostly. Uh, I had a lot of help from Michaels. But yeah, that's, that's the cool. telescope. Very cool. And it is just getting covered now. Okay. Well, Robert, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next time, I hope to uh, um, have you on when you're thank actually you. doing um, some outreach on uh, at one of your events. That would be super cool. So, okay. Um, there's another comment here. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Adkins says, I was the president of the, OK, uh, the OKC Astronomy Club at the time. <laughs> Me and a few members are the ones that that found the dark sky site. Oh, he's talking about the Oki Tech Star Party. Uh, Camp Billy Joe at, at the Black Mesa. The rest is history. Yeah, and it's a great history. If you haven't been to the Oki Tech Star Party, you really have missed one of the big um, and great uh, uh, star parties in some of the darkest skies in North America. So excellent place to go. All righty. I, I, at first, when you started, I, I did not realize that we were looking at two different views of the sun. But now I can see that and I can see some sunspots on the right and uh, definitely see the uh, sun in H alpha on the left. Uh, and I do see a little bit of a prominence sticking up there. That's very cool. Excellent. And that's a live view, right? Great. Cool. Okay. Yeah, this is a live view. Great. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, transition to watch a couple of videos that I thought you might find interesting from NASA, and I think one's from the European Space Agency. So um, I will take this uh, spotlight back, and um, here we go. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks very much, Robert. Here we are. Time and space as we know it started with a bang. What did the early universe look like immediately after the Big Bang? And how did that lead to us? I'm Leilan from ESA Education, and we're at the European Space Agency's Technical Center in the Netherlands to learn more about our cosmic history. From the Big Bang to the early stars and galaxies, we need to speak to an astronomer to find out more. Hi. Hi, hello. My name is uh, Rachna Vatodekar. I am a research fellow here at ESA. And uh, before I started uh, working at ESA, I did a PhD in astronomy from the University of Nottingham uh, back in the UK. And uh, even before that, uh, I'm an engineer originally. So you're an astronomer engineer. It sounds like the perfect person to ask about the early universe. 
So can you tell us what the early universe looked like? Sure. So um, our universe formed uh, in an event or in an explosion known as the Big Bang some 13.8 billion years ago. And uh, just within a second after that, the universe was filled with small particles such as uh, electrons, protons and neutrons. But because the universe was an unimaginably hot place uh, right after the Big Bang, it was not possible for these particles to actually come together to form atoms. But then the universe continued to expand and cool down uh, such that after about 400,000 years, when the temperature had dropped down to about 3000 degrees, uh, it became possible for these uh, particles to come together to form neutral atoms. Uh, atoms of hydrogen and helium and uh, these uh, hydrogen and helium uh, they were the first elements to form in the universe. So when did the first stars and galaxies come to be? So right after these very first elements that is hydrogen and helium were formed uh, there was a period in the history of our universe something that we astronomers refer to as dark ages. And as the name suggests, I mean, the reason we call uh, these period as dark ages is because there was essentially no source of light. The first stars and first galaxies, uh, they, they were not born yet. And so the universe was predominantly composed of these dark clouds of hydrogen and helium. And so these dark ages lasted for about 100 million years or so. And only after that, the, uh, the small dense clouds of hydrogen and helium they started collapsing under the influence of their own gravity, uh, becoming hot enough to kind of trigger the nuclear fusion reactions within them. Uh, and this led to the formation of the very first stars and first galaxies. So nuclear fusion essentially is that uh, when two lightweight atoms uh, are uh, forced together to, uh, to form a heavier atom and a lot of energy is produced as a result. And that energy is the light that we see. Exactly, that is, that is the light and the heat that we see from our own sun. That is exactly how it is formed. We've often heard this expression that we are all made of stardust. How is that possible? The light and the heat that we see from our sun, it is made through a process called less nuclear fusion. And uh, all the elements uh, that, we, uh, that, uh, that make up our human body, such as uh, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur, they were created in stars through the very same process of nuclear fusion. At the end of their lives, stars swell up, they expand and they explode in massive cosmic explosions uh, known as supernova. And when supernova explode, they expel all the material they have produced, including the very elements that uh, make up our own planet and even us. So essentially because we, all of us are carrying the remnants of these distant massive uh, supernova explosions within our own bodies, we, we say that we are made of stardust. The James Webb Space Telescope is often referred to as a time machine. How is that possible? How can it transport us so far back in time? Because uh, light takes time to travel from one place to another, we see objects not as they are uh, now, but as they were when they emitted the light that has traveled across the universe to us. So for example, the light from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach us. So when we are looking at sun, we are looking at it not as it is now, but as it was eight minutes ago. Similarly, the nearest neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, it is 2.5 million light years away. So when we are looking at Andromeda, we are looking at it as it was 2.5 million years ago. So essentially, all the telescopes are time machines, but the James Webb Space Telescope or the JWST, it's going to take us the furthest back yet. So if I have to put things in perspective, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, that we have now, it is the most powerful telescope and with it we have been able to discover galaxies as far back as 13.4 billion years ago. This was when the universe was just 400 million years old. But the James Webb Space Telescope, it has been designed to peer the universe even further than that, to find the first stars and first galaxies when the universe was just uh, 200 million years old. So we're talking about baby photos of the early universe. Baby photos will. of the early universe, precisely, yeah. Cool. When it comes to stars and galaxies, um, which one came first, do we know? We don't know that yet. Uh, all we know that is the very first sources um, of light, they, they came after the dark ages, as I explained earlier, so about 100, 150 million years after the Big Bang.
So yeah, I'm very much excited and looking forward to uh, work on the data from JWST very soon. Yeah, we hope to see it soon as well. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. No problem. This was so much fun. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tim Hunter. Tim has been a great friend and I've known him for decades. Um, he's also a gentleman who's done a lot for the astronomical community uh, and is one of the co-founders of the International Dark Sky Association. Tim um, uh, is always an interesting guy to talk to um, and uh, loves uh, doing astrophotography, he loves science, he loves, uh, um, his current lo love is writing books about astronomy. And uh, so Tim, I'm gonna give you the stage. Thanks for coming on to our Global Star Party and thanks for being my friend for so many years. Oh, it's wonderful. Scott, I was just trying to think about it. It's 30 plus, 35 years or so. Yeah, He's... it went by quick. <laughs> <laughs> went by real quick. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. I'm going to talk about very briefly, and you can feel free to uh, be a good uh, moderator and cut me off if I go too far. I want to talk about the Barnard Objects and the book that I uh, recently got out called The Barnard Objects Then as Barnard saw them and now as we interpret them. Okay, it's not, all right, there we go. So here's a copy of the book available, all good booksellers available from Springer Nature. But I wanna talk about a little bit about nebulae, which are just interstellar clouds of dust, hydrogen, helium, and often ionized gases. They're enormous in sizes, but, it, but really less dense than any vacuum created on Earth, even though we, the pictures of them look like there's all kinds of stuff there, but looking through enormous distances. You can class them as bright nebula, and these are visible either from fluorescence caused by hot stars and fluorescent processes in the nebular material, or reflectance of light off of particles in the nebulae, so-called reflection nebulae. The fluorescing nebulae are technically going to be rare or greenish. The reflecting ones are going to show bluish color. And what I'm going to talk about very briefly today is dark nebulae. Those are dark areas of dust and clouds that are silhouetted against bright star forming regions or star clusters. So dark nebulae are very common throughout the Milky Way. They originally were described actually probably by uh, William Herschel. Certainly it goes back that far. And they're for a long time felt to be holes in the sky. This is where there are no stars. I'm going to talk about E.E. E. Bernard the fabulous astronomer, and Max Wolf, his buddy. And these two gentlemen, 100 years ago, literally, did the first comprehensive study of these dark objects. And pretty much after studying them for many, many years, realized that they're actually obscuring material between us and background stars. So dark nebulae are extinction alike by dust and interstellar clouds. They're often associated with what's called giant molecular clouds. These are clouds that have molecular hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen is very difficult to detect uh, because it doesn't give much of a signal, but where there's molecular hydrogen and there's enough of it, that's areas of star forming. Uh, small rounded dark nebulae are sometimes called buck globules because these are often star forming areas. The dust particles are generally submicron size and they're coated with frozen gases like carbon uh, monoxide, nitrogen, and sometimes water. These dark nebulae usually have hydrogen in them, they have helium, they have CS gas, ammonia, formaldehyde, and they have actually have organic and even aromatic organic compounds. E. Barnard is probably one of the greatest astronomers of all time, probably the greatest, if not the greatest visual astronomer of all times. His eyesight and his visual observing was fantastic. Be ironically, because of his photographic skills, pretty much put visual astronomy out of business. So here's some seminal pictures of Barnard. The picture on the left there is of him and the 36 inch refractor at Lick Observatory. The middle <laughs> picture is him with the Bruce telescope when he took photograph things at Yerkes. And the picture on the right is a picture of him in older age. And this is an absolutely fabulous book by William Sheehan called The Immortal Fire Within. This is the biography of E.E. E. Barnard. Absolutely must read. 
Uh, this is really fascinating. Even though you know you know what's going to happen, it's wonderful to read it, and I recommend it highly. Max Wolf is also a very prominent astronomer in Heidelberg, Germany. Here's a picture of him. And the telescope there is a Bruce telescope. It's a twin inch, a twin 16 inch refractor. Wow. So Catherine Wolf Bruce is very important in the story of astronomy 100 years ago. She was a patron of astronomy and gave quite a bit of money in those days to astronomers. Her father was George Bruce and he was a tight founder and made a fortune in the early 1800s. And Catherine gave donations to Harvard College Observatory for the Bruce Telescope. She gave one to the University of Chicago, which is the Bruce Telescope that Marner used, and the one in Heidelberg, Germany, which we just saw a picture of. The two Bruce telescopes, the one from Harvard College Observatory and the one from the University of Chicago at Yerkes, have long since uh, bit the dust and are no longer in existence. In fact, the lens for the Bruce telescope uh, at Yerkes is hidden. Nobody knows where it is. It's missing in action, last seen somewhere in Greece. The one from the Harvard College Observatory is actually now in the Harvard College collection. It's a 28-inch diameter refractor. Barnard used these telescopes to produce a fabulous book called The Atlas of Selected Regions of the Milky Way. And Catherine Bruce, along the way, found the Bruce Medal, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And this actually is one of the most important awards an astronomer can win. This is an award that's given for a lifetime of service to astronomy. So there's a picture on the right of her father, and the picture on the left is supposed to be of Catherine Bruce, and this is taken off of Wikipedia, and I read that this actually is not probably a picture of her. Well, here's the Bruce telescope that she donated that E.E. E. Barnard talked to her, and this is completed in 1905 and set up in Yerkes Observatory. So hopefully you can see my cursor. The big lens here is a 10 inch refractor, which photographed on 12 by 12 inch plates. The smaller right here is a five inch guide scope. The one over here on the side is a six inch refractor, a Voigtlander lens that was purchased and that gave eight by eight plates. And occasionally Barnard would put a small, uh, what he would call a lamp, magic lantern, one and a half inch lens on here to give a wide field view. So there's a telescope as set up. Here it is in the hallway when they first got it. Here's a picture on the left is set up at Yerkes Observatory where he took wide field plates, typically about 10 degrees by 10 degree plates of the Milky Way. And here it is set up in, in, in 1905, it was transported to Mount Wilson. And he spent most of the year of 1905 in Mount Wilson taking photographs of the Southern part of the Milky Way and Scorpius Ophiuchus Sagittarius. So he published a list of 182 dark nebulae in 1919. After his death, prime examples of these photographs are published as a photographic atlas of selected regions of the Milky Way. This is edited by Edwin Frost, who was the director of Yerkes Observatory, and Mary Calvert, who was actually Barnard's niece and worked at the observatory. So they collected his unfinished work and put it together. So this was published uh, post-mortem. They included a second list that Barnard had started before his death, but hadn't gotten around to collating. And they started the numbering of that at 201 and did it at 370. So in this original publication, there are no Barnard objects from 176 to 200. So they number one to 182 and then one, uh, excuse me, one to 176 and then 201 to 370. Here's a picture of Edwin Frost, Yerkes, and here's Mary Calvert. She's looking through a 12 inch refractor in Kenwood Observatory, which was in the South Side of Chicago in those days. Well, his photographic atlas, the Selected Region Milky Way, uh, was a grant that he received in 1907, but he never got around to doing it because he spent years finally getting together, publishing his observations from Lick Observatory from 1889 to 1895. Took till 1913 to get that published. And then he selected 35,000 photographic prints that he first for his atlas. He looked at the, each one and expected to see didn't like the photographic process. So that atlas has published 700 copies that wow. each contain 50 large photographic prints. So only 700 of these books were printed. So if you have an original copy, it's worth thousands of dollars. And the first draft was 
complete it in 1922. Uh, and then he was too ill to complete it and no longer could work on it. And he died in the early 1923. And the 700 copies were finally printed and done in 1927. It's an extremely valuable book. So it was in two parts. The first part was the photographs and the description. These are 52 original prints from his negatives. And the second was the charts and tables that he had drawing showing the objects. <clears throat> you can look at this, a uh, total uh, digital imaging of this in the Georgia Tech website. And then a republish of this by Jerry Dobeck. This is really a wonderful. So Jerry republished it the same size, same everything, same font, everything. Uh, not the original prints. He digitized the best that prints he could find and republished it in Cambridge. And I really recommend this highly if you can find a copy of this. So here's our book, which is sort of a, a take on where we actually discuss these objects, discuss what they were known in those days, discuss what they're known now. And we have a forward by William Sheehan. I'm so proud of that. The introduction right here talks about a uh, very detailed description of photography and the history of photography and the history of astrophotography. Then we talk about an overview of nebulae. One of the things that I feel proud of is a large collection in this chapter, astronomical catalogs. Oh, I get very frustrated of seeing these initials. What catalog is this? Where did it originate? What is it for? And we don't have every one of them, but we summarize a large number. And then talk in this chapter about his photography. What kind of place did he use? How did he develop them? And I saw Terry had a picture of dark room earlier in this session. And Barnard was a master. He did all his own photography, all his own development, all his own printing. And then we discussed some of these objects can be visually observed. Others of them are only photographic. Talk a little bit of modern imaging, give some selective use. And then what we have done, Jerry and I, took 25 Barnard objects that he had marked on his charts, but not had numbered. And we gave him the numberings from 176 to 200. No verification that he would have numbered them that way, but we suggest these as, quote, the missing Barnard objects. And then close up with discussing, what are these now? What is the astrophysics of these? Why are they important today? Glossary, I tried to, every term that was in the book, I tried to define. And then we have a table of all these. So here we are out at the Grasslands Observatory in Southern Arizona. This is the Earth shadow rising. And here's the original observatory 24 inch telescope. It was mainly designed for original thing. And when I retired a number of years ago, I spent some of my life savings to put three buildings here with remote telescopes. These are remotely operated from Tucson. They work most of the time, but of course they don't work all the time. And one has to always be prepared in the middle of the night to get in the car and drive down and fix something. And so this is a 20 inch telescope in the far building, 24 inch telescope in the central building. The one that used the barn objects is a Takahashi 180 millimeter telescope with a Canon EOS uh, RA uh, full frame camera. So, because most of these are large enough, you want to do wide field imaging with about 500 focal length. Field of view happens to be on that 2.6 by 1.7 degrees. But we also have on loan. A Canon 200 millimeter F2 lens. This is a $25,000 lens, no longer being made. It's absolutely perfect. And it gives a 10 by 8, 6.8 degree field of view, somewhat similar to Barnard's plates. So here's a typical picture of Barnard 33, the Horsehead Nebula. This is taken with the Takahashi Canon EOS combination. And now Barnard listed his chart, took a picture of this, described it in 1905, did not call it the Horsehead, was not particularly interested in it. Years later, he actually looked at this with a 40 inch telescope at Yerkes, had a very hard time observing it, and had to realize that Bart Barnard was one of the greatest visual observers of all time. Discovered multiple galaxies, multiple nebulae, multiple star clusters, discovered the fifth moon of Jupiter, which got him world famous, discovered at least five or six comets in his lifetime, and he had a hard time visualizing this. Here's a typical picture of the North American nebula. And we can see I've labeled a variety of Barnard objects. These are dark, nebulous areas in these things. Well, here's a typical chart from his book. So this will be uh, plate uh, 41. And then Mary Calvert would draw a chart showing the objects that you're supposed to be able to see. So look at right over here. We see the famous E. 
right here. It's a barn on 143 and 142. Here's a Takahashi picture of it. And here's a 20 inch Beautiful. picture of it. So this is discussed and shown in the book. Here's another one. You notice this thing, barn art 63, right over there. Then here we have barn art 63, a wide angle view and what it looks like in color. And here's one that is called the Fish and Platters Barnard uh, 44 and 145 is above it. And here's a, so here's Barnard's original plate. And here's for the exact same scale, the Canon 200 millimeter F2 lens. So you can see how much more nebulosity you see with the color will tell you an awful lot more about this that Barnard was not able to see because his plates were only sensitive to ultraviolet and to the blue portion of the spectrum. One of the things I wanted to do in the book, and I got frustrated when I started reading about stuff, people described the funnel cloud or the stick in the star cloud or the northern coal sack or the sputum scar cloud or the Sagittarius small star cloud or large cloud. So what the heck are these? It's amazing to try to look these things up. So I looked them up, documented them, discussed them in detail in the book so that when you hear these terms, you can go look them up. The small Sagittarius star cloud is actually M. 24, and that was what was described by Messier. And here's a little bigger picture of it, a small Sagittarius star cloud. Here's a large Sagittarius star cloud. And that for the asterisk of dancing horse, which is a dark configuration a lot of people describe. Well, here's a couple of very good objects, Barnard 92 and Barnard 93. And here's NGC 6603. This actually is a wide angle picture of this small Sagittarius star cloud. This is actually M24. M24 is not NGC 6603. Messi actually described the entire star cloud. Why, I don't know, because it was pretty obvious that it was not a comet, but that's what he described. Inside of it are all these other objects. And here's M, uh, Barnard 92 and 93. These are very nice telescopic objects. Here's another thing. Barnard was very fascinated by this can you see Barnard 86? He discovered that or observed it uh, when he was searching for comets in the in the middle 1870s and noted it down. It had actually been observed earlier by Herschel and other people. And Barnard saw this was so dark and so wonderful. He thought that was a hole in the sky. What's neat about it, and this is a 20 inch picture of it, you can see the object there. It's right next to this star cluster. What I've done is blown up Barnard's plate uh, with approximately the same image scale. So you can see that the modern digital imaging and the longer focal lengths can give you much sharper images. So the Barnard objects, many of them are very large and they're worthwhile for visual observing. They can be visually observed on a dark sky site with free of the moon. A lot of them are stunning photographic delights. Uh, a lot of them are pretty challenging targets to see. And some are very small and very hard to distinguish in the background. And when you do long exposure color imaging them, sometimes they fade into the background and you're wondering why he actually identified these things. So here's an example of his chart 13, which is the region of real Ophiuchus. And you see these things in red, B200, B177, B176. Well, these are areas that Barnard and Mark, you can see the dashed lines, but he didn't give them a number. So in our book, we've just arbitrarily numbered these to complete his list because he obviously noted these areas but never got around the numbering them. And here's what that would look like if you take a long-term color picture of these things. Oh, yeah. You can see M4 and Terry's, our Barnard 176, 177, Barnard 45, 44, 43, and 42 he had described. So if you want to see almost all the Barnard objects in color, you can go to the Grasslands Observatory website and just go to the Barnard page and just grass, just type Grasslands Observatory, you can find it. Um, it's threetowers.com or grasslandobservatory.com. And then you can go to the Barnard page to see it. So to summarize here, before I'm asked to uh, quit, I want to say there, Barnard objects are very important from a historical point of view. I think, and I mentioned this very often in the book, many of these seem very arbitrary. And there are multiple dark areas not specifically cataloged by Barnard. He was very inconsistent on why he would label these things. He was inconsistent in his numbering. He was so busy doing all kinds of astronomy that I think he did this off and on. He would come back to an area, 
and he'd already used number 44, so an area next to uh, number uh, 44, he was up to number 213, so he'd have number 44 to next number 213. He said, why aren't these numbered in RA? Why aren't they numbered in secular order when they're not? Uh, but they're areas of intense study today because they're regions of star formation, the potential star formation. There are also regions where organic compounds are being discovered. So they're very interesting. Well, this is the end of Act 1, so I am finished. I will put it at this point. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim. It was uh, wonderful. Um, uh, the, uh, the Grasslands Observatory has been uh, something you've been working with for a long time now. I remember 30 some odd years ago when I first came out to visit you, I think you had just recently completed it. And um, uh, it's in pretty dark skies out there. So I'll have to get out there once again and Absolutely. check it out. Absolutely, that's right. So, yeah, well, that's great. Okay, so folks, we are gonna take a 10-minute uh, break um, and we're coming back with, um, actually, we're not taking a 10-minute break. We're going straight over to Cesar Brolo, uh, who's waiting backstage here. Cesar, you wanna come on? Hi, Scott. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> How are you today? Great. Um, now it's clear, uh, but uh, I need to to put my my go to much better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because my animation earlier was okay for the sky in in, okay. in the in the evening. Uh, uh, but now I have, you know, that sometimes I don't have all stars for alignment. Um, I lose my go-to alignment. My my image of the sky uh, uh, tonight is excellent. Last as the last week, comparing for for uh, you know for um, for that is the the sky the city sky is great. Only okay. maybe I need more. Uh, you know, go to alienation, alienation, but I can show you for the audience something like talking about about um, the sky and you know. Sure, uh, this is the, also give you a few minutes if you'd like. Um, yes, and, yes. Uh, after the after the ten ten minute bro uh, yeah, yeah. break. I, I see I, that Robert Wilmore has got um, uh, and it looks like these guys cut it off on the sun, and we can see some live sun views for a few minutes, and then we will uh, go to that break, and then we'll come back to you. Okay? Yes, yes. I have. Okay. If if we are lucky, uh, I I can see maybe I can see you. You can see uh, clouds in the in the horizon. Okay. But I don't know if they are moving from here. If not, well, you know, sure. uh, fortunately, I have, I can show nothing tonight. But, you know, now I have something in the field, stars, but I, I'm making, I can show, I can show you a, a short view of, of the, the sky okay. now. Ah. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is in the region of of the Scorpio, near to to in the area of of uh, Scorpio, the area of Antares. When I move the, the telescope, you can see some sometimes the different uh, star trails with different yes. colors. With colors, that's right. Yes. Sometimes when you watch the the the, uh, the stars like a point, it's not easy, but you know. Yeah, an old an old trick is to throw the image out of focus and yes, see the colors easier. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. All is in the region of, of Scorpio. 
I can show you more in this area. Mm -hmm. And we can say that all these stars are more than maybe 15,000 15, years like year uh, of distance and are stars that are impossible to watch to the naked eye in the sky. Sure. Well, I, I try to make a go to any nation in 15 minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, if we are lucky, but I think that the, the clouds are moving here, but, you know, we can try. I, I send you a message if it's impossible to, to show something. Okay. All right. Well, then, uh, Caesar, we will. The, yes, we can. <laughs> the audience can see that the the clouds are coming from from okay. the west. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. We yes, this is a light. This is light. This, this is a real live thing. View. That's right. That's right. Live view. Yes. Yes. Okay. We are going to. Um, we got a live view of the sun over here with Robert Wilmore. So let's. Uh, Let's go over there for a couple of minutes and then we can take a break. Um, we have ways to uh, keep the ball rolling. It's no problem. So, all right. Um, yeah, as you can see right now, we have uh, uh, to uh, the left of the screen, you've got an H alpha view um, and to the right uh, is a white light view. Uh, uh, and I can make out if you look at it carefully, you can see a prominence rising right at the top of the, uh, the sun on the left. Um, and uh, we got some nice sunspot, sunspot group here on, uh, on the sun as well. Probably that largest sunspot is bigger than planet Earth. So now the sun is, uh, was it roughly nine minutes, light minutes away? So we're seeing as it was nine minutes ago. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to look at the sun. It's our closest star. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I wake up in the morning, uh, you know, really genuinely trying to uh, generate um, uh, some gratitude for the sun um, you know, it is, it is the parent of the solar system. It's holding our, all of our planets in place. And, um, it's amazing all, you know, you think of all the things that's going on in the solar system and the sun is driving it, um, including our weather, you know, so, but that's, uh, that's wonderful. Here, I'll, I'll pull myself off here so we get a bigger screen of the, uh, of the views here. And we should take advantage of this for a little bit before you get too much in the trees there. Yeah, you can see the prominence. Yeah. And we are pretty much into uh, some leaf cover instead of cloud cover at this point. Ah, that's a great view. Look how big that prominence is. It's huge. All that plasma going out into space. All right. Mr. Wilmore, thank you for hanging in there with us and making this possible. It's great. Okay, uh, we will take a, um, we're going to take a little 10 minute break. Um, so it's a good time to um, go and get a uh, sandwich or take a bathroom break if you have to. And uh, we'll be back in about 10.
Well, we're back. Um, hope you enjoyed that little break there. Um, and um, Caesar, were you able to? Uh... Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, with clouds, but we we can talk about um, some object that we can appoint in the sky. My go-to is perfect, but I have clouds. You never can have something of, of much better say. You can never get all together functioning good. <laughs> Last week, uh, we have a beautiful show with you and John yes. Schwartzman. Um, we enjoyed a lot of objects. Well, I, I, I am in the region of Scorpio that I say, mm -hmm. let me share my telescope. Okay. Well, we are in Antares. Um, first of all, we can say that Antares is, that tonight is a night of how, how many times the, the light is coming from the star or from the object to us, how many in the history? Um, well, we can, we can uh, know that 164 years, like years ago, the time, the light of this, the, of this star are coming, maybe from the time of Civil War? No. Mo uh, uh, let me... <laughs> uh, in the history, 164, Scott, how many years? For the audiences, I, 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 know, I say that the, the brightest ago. star, yeah, 164, 164, is relative a close, a close as a star. Mm -hmm. Let me put in the center. I'm using live image of only the meat. That would have been 1859 is 164 years ago. Um, 1859. So what was going on on this day in 1859? Lots of historical events. Johannes Brahms gave his first piano concerto in 1859. Wow. Yeah. The fourth century Bible was discovered. Um, and the so-called Sinai Bible. And the light now of this star that came from 164 years ago, was started at that this is a live image it's not a recorder no no this is something so real that if i put my hand <laughs> well too red because the reflection of my hand you know but this is the idea for the audience 100 this is our a, a, a closest option in comparing comparing the scale of the light that we received in the time and well, we can we can go to M4 that is very near to this object. I go to the catalog using this, and I choose M4. I think that M4, the stars of M4 are near to. Four, excuse me, the option. Let's see, four is... Maybe uh, we can see... So the 7,000 light years away. 7,000. 7,175 7, light years away. Oh, it, it, it's really far away from Dantares. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Seven hundred. It, it it's was, like uh, a, the, was discovered the, the Middle Age. <laughs> yeah, it was discovered. This light started. And Charles Messier cataloged it in seventeen sixty four, and it was the first globular star cluster in which individual stars were resolved. So people discovered that this was. Uh, uh, wow. Indeed, you know, at seven hundred. At seven hundred. Like years, seven thousand. Seven thousand. Sorry, seven thousand. Seven thousand one hundred and seventy-five oh. light years. Wow. Each light year is five point nine trillion miles. Um, you know, so if you take that and multiply that by seven thousand one hundred seventy-five, that's how far away it is. Pretty far. Wow. But that's it's one incredible. of the closest things to us, and you know, with uh, deep sky, especially globular star clusters. Many of them are much further away. Wow. Yes, here I, I watch in this, from, from the information from, from the application, it's amazing. Yes. Uh, wow. What's amazing is that we learned how to discover a distance, you know. Yes. Uh, and the size is the size is seventy five light years across. Across from from yes. Yeah, again, this area. Huge. Yeah. Wow. It's huge. Huge. Yes, and have sense because yes, but it's incredible that seven seven thousand two hundred light years away. Yes. The same distance that that as. NGC uh, 6397, making this the two closest, <laughs> but are the closest, are the, the two closest globular cluster to no, our, the close ones. our solar yes. system. Yes, yes. yes. Well, we are thinking, in, you know, uh, when you think about our culture uh, in history talking, that we don't have... Um, how do you say? Maybe, maybe the the first they are they they call it uh, in, in the Egyptians uh, the Egyptian uh, archaeology mm -hmm. the oldest the oldest um, you know the oldest um, tombs that they they found are maybe around this time is around uh, uh, the the old. Egyptian uh, time is around 4,000 uh, years uh, before uh, Christ. And the light that came from this cluster is maybe 1,000 years uh, ago. It's incredible. Sorry about by the clothes, technical problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I love I love to put the real things where the people can say the, the the clouds moving and the the scale of this this is very small in the sky my my smaller maybe the the size of the moon is the, the entire the entire field you know yes and this is so far, far away. That is incredible. In this area, maybe let me opening <clears throat> a, a, a sky map while we are enjoying the the cluster. I'm stop share and but I'm opening an stellarium and. Enjoy the I I I share the the map. If we can go to another to another uh, object, but near in the area and with enough bright, you know, to be visible tonight that we have. 
really and for it's impossible for nebulas but maybe maybe the another one m80 okay it's possible Caesar, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, pick up the next speaker, uh, which would be Adrian? Yeah, absolutely, and then absolutely. In between uh, Adrian and the next speaker, uh, you should be on your object. I think I think there. that is the best. Yes. Okay. Maybe we can have the we are can get lucky and have a, a much better uh, sky. Maybe the clouds okay. are are going out. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Let me. Okay. Let me. Switch me for <laughs> for, for Adrian. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes. No problem. Hello, Thank everyone. you, Caesar. Sorry, okay. Switch me. Adrian. Oh, thanks. Okay. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you've been on the road, and yes. uh, where are you right now? I am in Denver, Colorado. Okay. okay. And uh, by you saying okay, that means my audio works. I see my video. Oh yeah, works. yeah. You got yep, good, audio, good video. Yep, I'm using uh. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> a different laptop and different system than I normally use. I oh. thought I was going to be on my phone, which is sitting right here. Sure. But I'm not. I'm in a uh, room. Three of us are going to be going down to Okie Tech. So okay. what I thought I'd do while Cesar, while you find M18, um, I'm going to share. Um, I've shared pictures that I've taken from Okie Techs over the last couple of years that I've been. But I thought it'd be a good time. Scott, Marcello, you're here um how are you doing i thought it would be good to share what i'm going to use the primary instruments for what i plan you pl what i plan to use to capture and this is the contraption that is going to be doing most of the capture what you have is a canon 6d you have a oh, wow. lens that is a, a 16 to 35 f28 mm -hmm. um it's an L lens for those that know about uh, Canon's L lenses. One important thing to note, manual focus. I use manual focus oh, because yeah. you're you're out at night and there is a, I've done the testing to where there's a couple ways you can get focus, but I've also, I've noted where it is on the camera and uh -huh. you probably can't see the, uh, Right around there is where Describe I get good focus. That. Okay. So when I'm out there, and you know, Noki Tech is a little darker uh, in Kenton, Oklahoma. So you you're always best off making sure you can turn your camera to the spot where you know it'll be mostly sharp, and then you can fine tune it from there. What's on here is an intervalometer that I bought from a camera store, and what this allows you to do. I don't know if you'll be able to see it if I turn it on. It may or may not show up. So Hello, what you can yeah. do with this is yeah. set times for exposures. So if you want to take multiple exposures, you can. I have it set up to take a couple of two-minute exposures where one two-minute exposure followed by a delay so I can turn off my little move, shoot, move tracker, which... If you yeah. put the whole thing together, this ball ball head mount goes on a tracker. This goes on a wedge, and I've actually used the wedge from uh, Sky. What is it? Uh, the Star Adventure from Sky Watcher. That wedge actually works. You just need something that allows this to be polar aligned, and then this will track and. The camera goes on top of this. So say I'm shooting at something towards the south. That's how the whole thing will look on top of the tripod. Don't have the tripod here, but this is tracking um, two minutes. I'll experiment with it and see if I can get more than two minutes and see how much data I can pick up. This is an 85 millimeter lens. Now, those of you that do photography, know the 85 is a portrait lens. I know the 85 as a great lens to stitch together um, photos. This is the part where I share screen. And before I do, of course, get the sky meter, see if we're getting 21.9, 21.8. It'll be interesting to see just how dark 
the Okie Tech Skies read. So let's see, we're gonna share. I'm just going to, I'll share Safari app and see if I can do that. <clears throat> so Martello, you'll recognize this is a version of the image that wound up in, uh, this is a different processed image. It wound up as the uh, head of um, Skies Up magazine and uh, still very grateful for that. This one, <clears throat> because I've taken a few versions, I had taken a few versions of that photo and um, this is more or less how it looks to you naked eye. Um, you may just be able to make out the HA regions that are here, um, depending on how good your eyesight is. But what I'll do is focus in. So wide angle shots tend to look like this. And I believe this, this was before taking a modified camera. The camera I showed you is modified. This is what you can do with an 85 millimeter lens. And it's essentially, you can take a mosaic of the area and you can get some incredible detail with it. So the plan is to, especially with these, these two nebulae that are in the scorpion, the cat's paw and the lobster claw are right here. You can kind of see this resembles a little bit of a lobster. If you do Milky Way photography, take a look at your image and then look down at these four stars and see what you have. If you've got enough detail, you may see something that looks like a little bitty lobster. Um, it's got a different name as well, but the lobster claw is one of its names. And this, for obvious reasons, is the cat's paw. Um, there are other, if you can, you can see there's enough detail to see the lights of a plane mm -hmm. going through. There's a cluster here. There's a little cluster here. There are all sorts of objects going along the plane of the Milky Way. And I'm sure this dark nebula may have a name, but a lot of times we focus on the overall picture, but if you yeah. can, you can get good focus and good detail. Look at that. You have, There's you know, the butterfly, M6 there. and M7, Ptolemy's cluster, the butterfly. And then going on up here, more clusters, more HA regions. This is where body's window is. These are things that are much easier to pull out of the, um, of the Milky Way, of the Milky Way region. And... How do you know you may be looking at a globular cluster? You see extra little stars floating it around. I think this is as far as I can zoom in. But for instance, let's go back out. There's so many. Uh, yeah, there's so many hidden gems here. Dark nebula there. Yes, and I thought this was M22, Scott. It okay. may yet be. And then other dark regions. So there's a lot to discover. Um, now, of course, when I redo this, mm -hmm. the goal is to not quite blow out the cores of these nebulas yeah. so that we can actually see some detail. Yeah. So, so getting some shorter exposures and then blend. Yeah. Shorter exposures or less, a little less gain. When I took these pictures, I'm sure I had the, I had aperture all the way up and I think I had my ISO all the way up. The darker the sky, the more you get and one way that classic astrophotography handles this is to take different exposures but don't move your camera move your you move your exposures you move your uh settings and you combine them and what you end up with when you stack though you stack everything together and you combine it your composite photo contains a lot of good detail in it and unfortunately we didn't we didn't quite get to um m so we did get m17 and this is as far as we got here so there's another mgc object i know of him look at the this is and real quick scott look at the detail in m23 here no oh, it's beautiful this is 
Yeah, this is a uh, it's a nice, bright, open cluster. You're seeing this in a, you know, if you had the ability to view HA regions and you're looking at it in binoculars, this is what you might see. And so when it's darker out, you know, you've got a nice dark sky. Getting things like this is you can do it with less exposure time mm -hmm. than um, when you have to. You can, of course, you can pull this off, but it takes longer exposure time. And one of the problems you have is you can only get so much that, you know, as you know, the sky moves, the earth rotates, and you can only get so much of it if you want to put it on the ground, you have to balance between when you want to take the exposures, how much of the exposure you want to take, and you know how much uh, of the ground, because this is going to move, and you're going to have to find a way to um, to marry the two if you want some sort of landscape. If you're just looking at the object, you're not worried about it. You can take as long you take as long an exposure as you need until the the object goes behind and of course star trails are very popular i did this one um i, the, I think this was a full transition the, where yeah the, the you see it rotating the... around the north star which does yeah. not appear unless this little sliver of it right here is it but um even the north star moves a little bit but yeah you know not as much as this is the here in stuff. Kenton, Oklahoma, not here in Denver, but in Kenton, these stripes may well belong to um, Ursa Major or the plow. Big Dipper oh. rolls behind this mesa, oh. a little lower in the sky than those of us that are that live in you know the forty-two degree, forty-one, forty-two <laughs> degree latitudes. Yes. So, so this wow, one, that's dramatic. Look at this. Yeah. And this was a redo of this image. These are the clouds. I remember doing a presentation and talking about if you see dark clouds, you know that you're in a dark area and there's a different shine to the Milky Way that uh, you just don't see. I redid it and got the foreground to come out green. I, you know, for the longest time, this was just in shadow. And uh, now, you know, you've got, you know, with the masking that some of the Adobe tools allow you to do now, you can take your old image, single images, and treat them as if they were two separate images. You can mask for the sky, you can mask for the ground, and it does a pretty good job. Yeah. So now you've got a nice contrast. This is Beautiful. when you're like shooting away from the actual campground. That's what you get. And this is another part of the campground. Those of you familiar with um, being at Okitex would know there's building down here. There's a little spot right here where this crosses. Yeah. This uh, campground is, uh, oh, I used to know the name of this campground, but I've uh, it escapes me. It's uh, Billy Joe, Camp Billy Joe. Camp Billy Joe. That's right. Yep, it is actually a Christian campground. They go there in July. And we wonder how do they avoid the heat because they it don't. gets really hot. <laughs> it gets really hot. <laughs> yeah. yes. so, so Scott, I don't blame you for coming. Last image I'll show, because <laughs> I've showed it on Global Star Party before, but this image was even more majestic to view than it was to try an image. Yes, you've got the sky glow, but it was the first time that I looked and I noticed, you know, the, the Cygnus region was as bright as the... Um, you know, it's as bright as the galactic center, just more is visible. And it, it gave this look to the sky that I tried to capture that look, just like the Orion region. I tried to capture that. And um, there's a couple of different attempts of me of capturing it the way that I saw it. A little bit of astro, classic astro, where you zoom in. And I think I'm out of that first those are first images look at the drastic difference when you try an image in a yeah you, know, you saw the orion picture look at me try an image at a site in michigan that just isn't as dark you know very similar settings you get all this data but it just the sky color is a little different 
it just doesn't it's still a beautiful shot but it just doesn't there's that same sickness region sickness setting it's just i still do it i still think it's a you know it's a nice image there's it's a little harder to get the type of look that you get when you're you know even when even when you stack your images this was an attempt to stack and this is when when you stack your images and you're in a lesser portal zone yeah. you begin to get some of the detail that you can get with just a with a straight image and let's see i thought you know the upper peninsula of michigan produces a very you know it's a dark enough sky but then you know this is a dark sky park and it's nice but then the second time you go you go out to Okie Tex and then this happens and you go okay any dark sky any truly dark sky location we'll end it with this one Scott any truly yeah. dark sky location you know there's a reason so many people come oh, yeah. out to turn on their yeah. telescopes to look at these things in the night sky because it, it is absolutely beautiful it's something you don't see um if you come from a location like i do um you don't see the milky way this clear now this is a processed image um i may have included and i probably no i didn't when other parts of the milky way are just as impressive but of course the core is a, you know the core is very bright but when this andromeda cassiopeia leading into perseus when this is just as uh you know this is just as impressive this is a uh, Malat. I do believe this is a Malat object. This giant cluster here in Perseus. Um, when it's that impressive, all this red comes from the red lights in camp, and it's it's something you'll even if you don't have the pictures to share, you have the memories. So, right. Go to a dark sky park. You know, Cherry yeah. Springs begins to give you what that's like, and if you come out west west of the Mississippi. The uh, you've got higher altitude, less humidity, yes, and your grayish your images. If you if you tune your images to look the way that the sky color was when you see it, you're gonna get this dark grayish sky color. A whole lot of stars, bunch of starlight, <laughs> bunch of starlight, and yeah. you will if you love the night sky, you will enjoy it. So I'm gonna stop my share here, Scott, and. Um, All right. Yep, we're okay. about to go have dinner. Tell John Schwartz. Right. Look forward to uh, watching this presentation if he comes yeah. back on. Uh, okay. Thank you all for having me. We pulled it off. We got this set up so that I could uh, use my Mac to share some images. And now turn the, sky, uh, the star party over to Cesar because I'm sure he probably has something else to show us. Yeah. Thank you all. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just a quick check in with uh, Cesar. I think he's um, I think he's indoors right now. The telescope's alone, uh, so we will switch to our next speaker, which is Marcello Souza. Marcello, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party. Hi, how are nice you? To be here. <laughs> thank you for the invitation, Scott. It's great to see you. My pleasure. And today I have news. Ah. Uh, something happened because I was in the right place in the right moment. <laughs> I, I, I made a discovery today. I will oh. show here. Uh, not me, né? because I asked for an image to participate in a group that analyze comets. And uh, we analyze a special comet. And uh, I was the observer responsible for one image this night mm -hmm. and in this image something different happened in the comments okay then uh, we, we pub and the group published today the results is an important result i will show now first I, I i let me share my screen i'm very happy with this result because First time that uh, I saw something that nobody saw before. <laughs> can you can you hear me? That's can you hear up. me? Yeah. Scott, can you hear me? I hear you fine. 
Yes. Okay, but something happened in my computer. Oh, 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 oh. what a moment. Uh, it's not this. I, I will stop share and share again. No problem. So, something happened different here. Uh, let me see if I will share the correct one. Ah, uh, now it's okay, no? Can you see? Yes, I can see you. Why, why is not working? I don't know. There we go. And just take it into presentation mode. Yes, I don't know what's happening. It is in presentation mode. I open again. Hold a moment, Scott. Sorry. But my computer, sometimes he wants to do by his own. I don't know why it's not to work in presentation mode. It's okay. We can still see the pictures. Okay, okay. I will show here. Uh, but I can't see the picture. <laughs> but I, I, I will say what, what happened when the okay, computer worked. I, I, I will share. Uh, what happened? Ah, here are the maze. I'll try to put in presentation mode. Oh. Work it. Let me see. I work it. It's working. It's working. For me, it's working. Uh, not from here, no, not yet. Can you see the presentation? No, no it's just all. It's a black screen. Wow. Mm -hmm. And now. Not sure. not sure what's happening. And now, can you see? Mm, not yet. Oh wow. Let me try one, one time more. If it didn't and work, I will show the internet because the result. And now, can you see? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yes. This, this, is, this is the event that you organized last week. Uh, Fernando Fabiani from Uruguay was here with mm -hmm. me. And uh, we organized many activities in four different cities. This, uh, I will show very quick the image. We are talking about the, the Protect the Dark mm -hmm. Sky. She, mm -hmm. He is the director of the Dark Sky in Uruguay, chapter in Uruguay. I am the director of the Dark Sky chapter here in Rio de Janeiro. And we visited, we have organized events in four different cities. Have a lot of students involved. This wow. was one of the presentations here in another seat. And we have a lot That's of impressive. students that That's participated in this, this activity here. I also yeah. had the opportunity to look to the sun here. Another seat. We are talking with the head of the Department of Education of the city, and we have a fair uh, with a lot of students there, and we have the opportunity to look to the sun. That great kids here involve another meeting here, another school, the event in another school. Uh, talking about the uh, also to protect the dark sky and find students that are motivated to join us. Yes, how, how many students? How many students were there, Marcello? In total, in total, in, in one city, the big one, we have yeah. 250 students. Wow, that's why okay. in the auditorium. And That's in other cities, you had the four, 51. In this last one that I showed, 40. And you have mm -hmm. another one that have uh, almost 300 students in the fair. Then the total, we talk, have the opportunity to talk with uh, more than 600 students. Oh, wow. In the, three days, in three days. And Fantastic. this is a place that uh, wants to be the next dark sky place here in Brazil. We are visiting, and, and the, at the end, we organize a video conference with the participation from person uh, we have a, the director of Dark Sky in Argentina and the director of Dark Sky in Mexico that participates online with us here in Brazil. Uh, with Fernando Fabiani from uh, Dark Sky in Uruguay. And now, is the result that I received today that was a big surprise for me. This was the first picture because I'm participating in the Falk 
telescope project. We have access to telescopes with two meters, two telescopes with two meters, the mirror with two meters, diameter of two meters, uh, more than one telescope with one meter uh, diameter, and many with uh, uh, 40 centimeters. And this was the first image that I took using the telescope with two meters. That is the image of the comet 12B. And this was the image that I took from this same, the same uh, comets, but uh, now it's very far from us. It's in the center of the image here, the comets. Oh, yeah. This was in, if I'm not wrong, in August 25, this image. Now I took an image this night, look at to the comets in the center of the image. What was registered? I never noted this, but uh, Richard Myers from the Beach Astronomical Society that participated in the Comet Chase project mm -hmm. that uh, noted that uh, happened a mini outburst in the comets. Then, uh, uh, first time I, I, I asked the, the image in the correct time, the time that happened the mini outburst in the comets. Then uh, uh, this is the only register until now that I know of these outbursts. And as a result of this, today the group that it's not only me, né, the, is coordinated by Helen Rusha from the Cardiff University and Richard Myers that uh, are doing the studies with the mazes of the comets. They published today a note in the Astronomer's Telegram. Né? Everybody knows that uh, a small outburst uh, was registered. And uh, this was from the, my image, né? the image that I took using this telescope. Is here, Marcelo Souza. Né? I'm very happy. The first time that I, uh, uh, is one time in life né, that you can see something different happen. Yeah. Né? And it is the only one that made the registration of this. Né? And is here. Today, the analysis of the observation shared by Marcelo Souza, I use, I use this Musket 3 instrument on the Fox Telescope North, two meters telescope, has identified another small outburst of amplitude dot 34. Then it's nobody knew about this, and it's the first time. I'm very happy that I make a contribution. Right? With the amazing that uh, I had the opportunity to, to take these nights. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is the page of the Comet Chasers. And uh, why he's no <laughs> he notes, he said, my note that this happened. Here is the light curve uh, you see of the comet. And you see here the image from today. You have uh, here the magnitude here is. is he, he, this was the last one that I registered, and the today one. And you saw that it is more intense, the light of the comets. And he made the, he had the opportunity to analyze the photometry of the, the comet, and he confirmed that it was a small outburst today. And is the first contribution. I'm very happy with this. No? First time that I saw something different. And uh, I, I think that's only the image that uh, I got that uh, showed this. Now they are trying another image today and tomorrow and see what uh, is happening with the comments. But it's already published in the Astronaut Telegrams. No? That, that's published. And now I will, sh I will talk uh, very uh, not uh, so long about the distance because I had the opportunity to take another images using this telescope, the Fox, in this project. Edu now, educational opportunities. And uh, I'll talk about the distance here. And here is the, the how we imagine that is now the shape of the Milky Way. Uh, 
aberta de eh, elliptical galaxies in this position of the sun in the Orion spur and inside the, the Milky Way are um, the, the stars that you see during the night. The other uh, few stars appear like, like uh, galaxies for us uh, that are, are not inside the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, these are the near stars. Uh, from here, we are in the center here, the sun, and the closer star is one of the stars of the triple system of Alpha Centauri, that is the light you need more than four years to reach us. That is four and dot three years, more or less, to, to one of the stars of the triple system. And here, the radius here is five light years right, in this image. And the, another one that the, only the star that have name that I have here is the Barnard star that is almost six light years from us. And another one is Sirius that is almost eight and a half light years from us. And another one that is easy to find is Procyon from Canis Minor that is more than 11 light years from us. These are the closest uh, stars, part of the closest star. And the area that you look to the sky, every hour of us know that you are looking for the past. Né? And the, now, here is the Southern Cross here, that uh, from us is very important to us, that uh, you have here. You have uh, a star that uh, is a beta from the Southern Cross that is more than 350 light years from us. And uh, the, you have one that is a, a little far from this one that is almost 306, more than 306 light years. And in 10,000 years, we are not going to see more the, the Southern Cross né? because of oh. the movement that you have in the universe. <laughs> but you have time, né? That's so 10,000 years. <laughs> and now are the, gal near, the nearest galaxies from us. Né? You have here that one that is the dwarf, the Canis Major dwarf galaxy that is the closer galaxy, uh, is a satellite galaxy from us. I have here the distance that 25,000 light years from us. Mm -hmm. And from here in the southern hemisphere, you can see the two other galaxies that are near us. I have two other ones, but these are very easy to see in the sky that they are large, large Magellanic clouds. That is almost 160,000 light years from us, and the small Magellanic clouds that is almost 200,000 light years from us. And the Andromeda galaxy, that in the Triangular galaxy, that uh, it belongs to our local group right here. Mm -hmm. And the Andromeda galaxy is almost two, two and a half million light years from us. And the Triangular galaxy, near 3 million light years from us. This is our local group of galaxies, where the galaxies, the force of the gravity makes that the galaxies uh, are moving in the one in direction of the other. Right? And the Andromeda galaxy is moving in the direction of the Milky Way. Right? Here, the gravity force is strong enough to make this galaxy to, to come near. Né? And I had the opportunity to take pictures using a two meter telescope, and oh, wow. I could look very far né? from here. This is one of these, this NGC 1325, or it is almost near. Seven 
5 million light years from us. Is a spiral galaxy was discovered by Herschel in 1979. Is in the constellation of Eridanus. 75 million light years. 75 wow. million light years. And I had the opportunity to take a picture of this galaxy. This, is this, this project is fantastic. Let's right? give you us the opportunity and we can involve students to do this. The other one is this NGC 1642 that is 200 million light years from us. The spiral galaxy in the constellation of Taurus. Is a, I, I had the opportunity to look for 200 million light years. And this, I had the opportunity to do this in real time. I was moving the telescope in real time. Right? And access of this telescope in, in Hawaii. This is another one that is NGC uh, 1003, 36 million light years from us. Right? It was discovered by Hesh in 1784 in the constellation of Perseus. And this is near, nearest the in com we compare with the others, that's M33, the triangle uh, galaxy yeah. that I showed there. Uh, yeah. That is almost this, this, a little more than Andromeda. Andromeda, two, two and a half million light years. This is located a, a little more than three million light years from us, the triangle galaxy M33. And uh, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to take pictures of this galaxy and can study this galaxy. Now we are, we, I had the opportunity to take in different uh, filters with different filters. Now we are producing a color image with these different uh, images from different uh, filters. And this, this is the Skies Up magazine. <laughs> to yes. end my presentation. Thank you very much for Thank the opportunity. Much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Marcello. It's wonderful. Yep, uh, Skies Up is a, a free publication. It's um, uh, the contributors are astronomers from around the world, so it's a global astronomy magazine. I'm going to put a link here so you can go get your own copy of it. And. Um, ah. I scratch yep. it before I forget. I shared here the link for the. Oh, I don't know what's happened to my computer, but I will try to share now the link for the Astronomy Telegram article yeah, about the. Text and I'll, I'll share it on. I share it now. I share it now. With the information right. about the small water bursting, the comet 12P. Oh, Thank you cool. very much. It's a great pleasure. Congratulations. Nice to be with all of you. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Okay. So there we are. And through the power of the internet, it's shared all over the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcello. It was great. All My right. Um, let's check back in with Caesar and see what uh, what we've got here. Well, okay. Uh, as uh, as we was thinking, uh, I can sh uh, share it again. Okay. But I choose I choose uh, to show to show Antares again because it's. Uh, a bright star um, with a cloud that uh, the people can see uh, in the sky in direct and in my in my uh, from my okay. telescope. Uh, you know that it, it's impossible uh, to show more than M four that we we watch it, it, it. Uh, uh, earlier and uh, I try with M80, but it's something that uh, when uh, when we are having next week or mm -hmm. <laughs> you know uh, maybe we are we are uh, having we will be more lucky in the next uh, 
presentation in the next week in the next global safari because it's very okay. interesting to to traveling uh by this area and uh, tonight i can show you something uh i share how the movement actually of the clouds are from the west and uh, in the satellite this is so real that you know um i well you don't I, control the clouds you are watching the 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 the, the sharing ah oh, sorry sorry no no yes i first of all i'm sharing the and that are, is, sorry that we I, have clouds I, I i we have clouds yeah we got clouds yes yes John, we was That's not a beautiful uh, shot, lucky though, last, the last week that, yes, yes, clouds. And sometimes we have some, some, uh, you know, some clear parts, but maybe we have uh, higher clouds. I don't know. But actually, you can, you can see by my telescope that, you know, oh, and yeah. this is, yes, and this is, how oh, it's moving me it's moving let me let me share it how about happens. some spiders tonight the tarantula is that potentially up or uh, uh yes unfortunately or, it's impossible to 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 show something like like last week right here you can see actually the oh, movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right exactly. over your apartment. This is, See yes. That? Here is Maxi in Chivilcoy, and I am here. In yeah. You have um atmospheric river tonight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, it's going to clear that. behind it, though, Caesar. In about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to get that clearing again. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll maybe, yeah but maybe this area, but but you, if you um, let me, I don't know if I can, I can, ah, here. The problem is that, you know. Mm -hmm. so okay. okay. You're near the ocean there too, right? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. yes. This area is Estuario, and this is, but I think that. It's so different, the, the, this one. Here you have snow, actually. In this part, yesterday they have snow. Here wow. they have rains, you know. It, it's it's really big and different, yeah. the areas. Um, in All this right. area, it, 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 uh, here you have Brazil, you know, where Marcelo is. And this, this is more rainforest. Yeah. Well, Caesar, let's but, let's do this. You know, let's let's I go was to our next. Let's go to our next speaker with the we'll audience. Our next speaker, and then we'll come back and check again. Okay. Yes, no problem. I I think that okay tonight is is uh, <laughs> okay for me. It's okay. I I have to cold. <laughs> I return next next week with more live image. Um, okay. I am presenting the Catamarca Star Party in October. All, All right. right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you in a bit, Caesar. Right. Okay. All right. Our next speaker is uh, Ron Breacher. Ron is a gifted astrophotographer. Uh, he often shares his uh, images to me in email, and and uh, almost every day I see something new from him and uh, I love the work that he does. Ron, thanks for coming on to our Global Star Party. What's happening I, this week? I could not turn, uh, you know, Scott just contacted me yesterday and said, hey, this is the theme. Yeah. Right? We're looking back in time. <laughs> and I think I responded within a couple of minutes, right? Yeah, we yes. this one. Uh, because, you know, I've often said, telescopes or time machines but yes my wife has corrected me and changed my way of thinking about this the telescope is just between the stars 
and the time machine. Mm -hmm. So the time machine relates to the detector of the light. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit. Okay. And uh, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, that we're all time machines. So let me share my screen with you and uh, switch over to my presentation. So a uh, little, little tip, I often put my conclusion on my title slide. So there's the conclusion that I'm going to try to leave you with tonight. We're all time machines. And uh, I'm going to... I'm going to do that by um, hopefully showing you some cool examples and talking about some neat ideas. I, uh, I love to write and teach. I'm a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope, and I write for Amateur Astronomy Magazine as well. And I love to teach uh, online and uh, in person, one-on-one -on -one or in groups. So. Uh, we do masters of pixinsight.com uh, tutorials and uh, subscription tutorials. And uh, I also provide teaching one on one. So if anybody wants to reach me, my email is at the bottom there, arbreacher at rogers.com. This is me standing with uh, a Celestron 14 inch telescope that I recently mounted in the observatory. Scott, this all came together when we were at NEF. Oh, right. Um, when we were at NEAC. And uh, so I've just got this going. So that Floria pictures you're seeing is from this new telescope, wow. which is connected to a camera on the back, which is another kind of time machine. But tonight I'm going to, like I said, try to convince you that we're all time machines. And before we can do that, we got to get our heads around the speed of light because light travels really incredibly fast. And um, then I'm going to show you how we're all time machines and give you some really neat examples all in about 10 minutes. So I've given this example before uh, in, in a global star party because it helps people get their head around the speed of light. So if we think about kind of a regular human speed of 100 kilometers an hour, which is about 60 miles an hour, um, if you were driving at that speed, it would take you 16 and a half days to drive around the earth. It would take you six months to drive to the moon and 170 years to get to the sun. So that's at a regular kind of speed that we can get our heads around easily. But if you were traveling in a light car, you were driving at the speed of light, all of those times get really, really short. So less than a second to get around the earth you could get to the moon in a little more than a second and to the sun in under 10 minutes at that speed and so light travels really fast but it's important that it doesn't travel infinitely fast in other words if the sun suddenly disappeared from the universe we wouldn't know about it instantaneously it would take eight minutes and 20 seconds before we would know about that so anytime we look at anything there's time that has passed so for the nearest star more than four years for galaxies the light might have been traveling for millions or billions of years so we always see things as they were not as they are and the further away things are, the further back in time we're seeing them. But it's, it's really important to note that even if you're looking at somebody across the room, the light reflected off their face took time to travel to your eye. So even in that close setting, we're looking back in time. It just becomes really noticeable when we look at things that are really, really far away. So... That's why I say we're all time machines, even the non-astronomers, even the people that are just looking across the room are looking back in time. We're always looking back in time. So I want to give you some cool examples. And every one of the examples that I picked is something that I've seen with my eye as the detector. So they're, yes, these are photographs. They were taken with a camera. 
but I pick them because I've seen each of them with my own eye. I've seen into the past with my own eye. And in the case of this, the Crab Nebula, I've seen 6,000 to 6,500 years into the past, 4,000 years BC. And another really cool thing about, about a supernova remnant like the Crab Nebula is that it's not the same every time you look at it. So I went and dug around and I found um, a journal article from 1942 taken by uh, Bad and published in the Astrophysics Journal. And I've oriented it pretty much the same way. And I want you to just notice these two bright stars at the top here. Notice that the edge of the nebula doesn't cover those stars in this older image. In the new image, it goes way past those stars. Oh, yeah. Now, there's a V of stars down here. Unfortunately, I've got the, the words covering it, but there's a little V here. And right in the middle of the V, there are two faint stars right here. And they're right at the edge of the nebula in 1942. 80 years later, they're engulfed within the nebula. Here they are right here. Yeah. So even in 80 years, a relatively, like a human lifetime, we can see this changing. How cool is that? That's very cool. This is another one of my favorite ideas when we think about, when we think about um, peering back in time. We've all been talking about things as though they're a specific distance away. And even on this slide on the very bottom, you see I've got that it's about 2.3 million light years away. That's really just the average distance. This, this galaxy occupies space. It's about 100,000 light years across. So in fact, you're not looking at one point in time. You're looking at every point in time in that 100,000 year time span. And so the time that it took for the front edge of the galaxy, which is closer to the bottom, is 100,000 less years than it takes for that light from the back end to reach us. So I just think that that's really cool. Remember, even though we see things as two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional out there. And if we want to extend that thought just a little bit further, we're not only looking at 2.3 million light years, plus or minus 50,000. We're looking at every time in between then and now, because all of the stars, all of the single stars that you see in this image, all of those are inside our galaxy. Yeah. So just uh, this kind of thing really makes me stop and think. Here's uh, another example of uh, a couple of different objects here that I that I want to point out. It looks like just one thing, but the main thing here is an open cluster called Carolyn's Rose Cluster, NGC 7789, uh, and it's about 6,700 light years away. But you'll notice this bright red star here. That bright red star um, is much closer at 1,094 light years away. Although it looks like part of the cluster when you just look at it in 2D, just hold that thought that, uh, that they're at different distances away. Not only are they at different distances away, but that one star is a variable star, so it's not static. So this is what this star looked like in, uh, I think it was in 2000 and yes, it was 2011 when I took this picture. And um, that red star that you saw was really nice and bright. Well, a couple of years later, a friend of mine asked me to image this cluster for him. And I went out and I imaged it. And this is what I saw. Oh, wow. So, 2011. 2013. So I was pretty new at this. 
huge. This is a teachable moment. Always do your homework before you write to the Harvard Central Bureau for astronomical telegrams and tell them that a star disappeared. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, I'm now the subject of talks by another friend of mine who's a variable star specialist mm -hmm. who teaches people how to do their homework. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's what happened. In the two years between those two pictures, I happened to catch this star at its maximum and its minimum. And remember that the star is in the foreground, the cluster is in the background. Mm -hmm. So binoculars and telescopes can help. While I was uh, watching you guys on the big screen, on the little screen, I was getting my telescope shooting. So yes, sometimes my time machine is uh, a C CMOS sensor, a camera sensor. Mm -hmm. But really, we're the real time machines. There's nothing more special than getting your eye up to the eyepiece and letting those weary, long traveling photons flood into your eye and have that experience. And remember, every photo that I picked here was of something you can see in a backyard telescope. So with that, thank you very much for inviting me to talk tonight. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I love uh, your analogies and um, you know I think that uh, it's something that I'll be able to use also when I'm explaining trying to help other people wrap their head around distances and the scale of the universe and time you know yeah and it, you know it's a tough one you know so <laughs> why don't we check in just before I give up my share why don't we sure. check in on my time machine that's out in my observatory, just on the other side of the driveway. Okay. So here we go. I'm imaging uh, NGC 7129 tonight. Oh, and yeah. uh, what you're seeing is a five minute exposure through the red filter. And it looks like my guiding is at about 0 0.4 arc seconds. Wow. And uh, this is with the 14 inch telescope. That's great. So, looking really nice so that's that's what i was doing while i was watching uh watching the global star party i was getting this running that's awesome <laughs> all right great. let me I look, look forward to seeing the fi finished image that's great man i'll disconnect from that hopefully i just didn't shut everything down <laughs> yeah ron thank you so much wouldn't be the first time oh yeah Yep. Anyway, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna take off. I okay. really appreciate you inviting me to speak tonight. Yes, yes. Well, uh, I thank you too, uh, Ron. Great images, and um, uh, you know you're a gifted teacher. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. So um, our next speaker is uh, John Schwartz. Uh, John is. Uh, Hails from California. Uh, John and I have known each other for, gosh, I don't know, 20, 25 years maybe. And um, uh, he is uh, he is always someone that's full of energy and uh, loves astronomy. Um, and uh, he is an incredible artist. And um, uh, he loves those big telescopes too. So, John? That's oh, what I want to do is get a I bigger see, I see an award there. Yes, I um, just got it as you guys were talking. It came to the door. Wow. I thought it was my pizza. <laughs> you thought it was a pizza. This is better than a pizza. Let me turn the lights on. I'm, I'm in a really nice place tonight in the clouds again. Yes. Like Caesar. But you let's see if I can. Entirely. I can yeah, I was. Good. They beamed me up tonight. If there you can you believe go. that, let me see if you can. I don't know if you can see it. It's reflective. It's hard, yeah, because it's black on black with your green screen. But uh, first place, oh, wow. Schwartz. We can see let that. Me, let me do the light real light. Maybe we can get it. Come on, baby, give it to me. All right. Well, we're SOL. It's reflect. It's so beautiful. I can't <laughs> believe it, man. 
It's got a big Saturn on so there. This is this is from the Astronomical League, correct? Yes. Yep. yep. And the first place for, um, for. I wonder if I dim it down. Let me see. Your space art. Okay. Well, never mind. Anyway, we it's a nice it's award. A nice and uh, it's great. Congratulations. To the Astronomical League. Um, great yep. place to be to join. Yep. They have a lot of uh, great stuff from awards, which I just got one. And they have uh, so much knowledge and information and such great people. Yes. One of the best organizations I've ever had a pleasure of working with. Um, just prompt, really great thing and uh, teaching me so much. I've been doing this my whole life and I'm learning a lot more yeah. with leagues. So I'm really excited. And oh, that's great. Is, this is a league event, so yep. we're, we're doing good. Yeah. So my background, you know, so not too far, maybe a couple hours away in the clouds. And then this is my my uh, alien shirt. Nice. I have. Looks like a glow in the dark shirt. I do want to know if they're real, and I would ask them to take me to M fifty one. That's as far as I'm going to go. 23 million light years <laughs> so it's a That's long way to go <laughs> you know the problem is when i came back nobody yeah. would be here that i knew maybe my uh That's children's okay. children <laughs> <laughs> i could they could yell at me <laughs> That's right. well they'll check your dna and then they'll go oh wow okay you've got you know 500 relatives been born since then so maybe more yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is a great topic. And, you know, the greatest caveat is when you're at a star party and you can tell people that how far back in time would you like to go? And they, they don't understand at first. And they say, no, really, because most of these objects are light years away. So yeah. we'll start with some of the closer stuff, a few of the planetary nebulas and work our way out to the globs and then way out to the galaxies and quasars okay you know my my last uh big star party i was shocked to find out that one of the objects i was looking at was the 270 million light years away hmm. i mean when i when i read that i kind of just like, that's the triassic period here on earth it, this it's is when, this is when the earth is recovering from massive extinction and uh, dinosaurs are just coming on the scene. And that's if you could take that light and just blink it here. You know, the distance covered, if you combine that into the equation, you just can't imagine. You can't even fathom how far you're traveling. It's just, I mean, you know how you drive and, and you see mountains when you're driving on the road and you go, okay, we got to get to that range and then I'll be coming into the valley and getting closer to my destination yeah literally you can drive at the speed of light forever and you'll never even get there you're just driving like you're stopped yeah it's been just amazing so who knows if you can bend it and uh, you know like bring the corners together and fold them and touch and join in one place i'm not sure i understand all that uh, you know, it was nice of him to mention that Carolina Rose Cluster as well. On cloudy nights, Frank uh, posted a beautiful sketch of that. Um, and it's probably one of the best open clusters in Cassiopeia hmm. to uh, view. Now, if Caesar can get it going, I'd like him to show us the Southern Jewel Box. Because that is a gorgeous cluster uh, compared to our Jewel Box. I mean, ours is very nice, but check out this uh, little cluster back there. Pretty neat, right? Yeah. So I, I love looking at the open clusters. You know, uh, there's some great ones that we can look at, you know, year round, which is good, especially the winter has some amazing ones. Mm -hmm. But I, I like to go further out and do a lot of globular clusters and you know, we just finished the spring galaxy season. So now we're getting closer to the uh, winter season and the planets are coming around. So that's exciting. 
So let me get this thing started here. I'm going to try it. Uh, maybe I can do a thing at the end, hopefully. And um, it's music. It's one of my things I put together. I may just have to screen share in order to pull it off, but I'm going to give it a try to close. I was trying to get my granddaughter to sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. We've been rehearsing, but um, she wasn't ready. <laughs> So this is a uh, drawing. Uh, this is a great galaxy to look at. It's a very long, elongated galaxy. You know, when you look at it, it's the uh, epitome of an edge on. Basically, you can imagine that if we were in our own Milky Way galaxy and we just shot out light years way out on the same plane as our galaxy. So it's like looking at a plate sideways. Hmm. You're seeing that dust lane, and those are actually the spiral arms of that galaxy. And they're um, compressed, and you can't see the plane, like the, the grand spiral of it. But if you could fly back on top of it, you would be surprised how much it would look like our Milky Way. But it also would probably be a grand spiral galaxy, mm. which is a wonderful face-on spiral, like uh, M101, M51. M100, there's there's quite a few of them, but um, they're they're interesting to look at because it's a different view that you're used to seeing, and it, it's iconic to see those certain kind of edge-ons. If you look below, you'll notice a satellite galaxy, just like our Milky Way has the Magellanic Clouds. So when these little teeny galaxies are just cruising around, minding their own business. They got a little too close to that big galaxy. And guess what happened? It got sucked in hmm. and it's tidally locked and it'll never escape. It'll just orbit that for eternity for eons and eons, which is kind of cool. I mean, I wonder if they could ever spiral in and crash into the earth, you know, or not the earth, the galaxy. I'm thinking of the moon. So, yeah, this is uh, 30 to 50 million light years away in Como Berenices. So it's pretty far, a little further than M51, but not as close as Andromeda. Hmm. Uh, this is another one, 5907 That's in the one. constellation Draco. This is a, a format that when you go on cloudy nights, and you present your sketches, this is a kind of like a template. So you have a circle and then you have columns for, you know, your information, such as the object. Uh, you could tell the telescope you use, the magnification, the location, scene conditions, uh, which would be darkness, transparency, and seeing are the three factors that will give you good seeing. So when you're doing this hobby, it's good to check Windy or um, the clear sky clock to find your location and see what the weather's going to do. Because it's sure not good when you go out and it rains. And that just happened uh, up at Mount Pinos. It rained like you would not believe just before the hurricane hit. Oh, boy. This one I'm really proud of. Uh, this is such a dim object. This is in my favorite constellation, one of them, Leo, because I was born in July. And um, I love my zodiac sign. So constellation Leo has some amazing galaxies in it, all different types. Um, some of the most impressive ones, M65, M66. Yes. So when you're uh, cruising around with even a six inch scope, you can hit Leo and you can nail about probably 10 good galaxies. That'll give you a good view. You'll see some structure. Uh, this is NGC 3338. I just completed this just before. It took me all day to get it right. I almost didn't make it and I was falling asleep doing it just staring at the screen for that long and, and not getting it quite right. I hope it looks okay for you. Uh, this is 76 million light years away, uh, 14th magnitude. 
And now uh, we're just getting a glimpse of that little spikes, the diffraction spikes from the spider on my 28 inch, which is an Astro Systems spider. Very good. So this is a nice tilted spiral and um, something caused a little bit of a distortion of it somewhere, but maybe it absorbed a smaller one. It's hard to say. Uh, the next one is from our last viewing session. This has taken probably a few weeks, uh, almost a month to get it right. It's a Messier object, M74 in Pisces, <clears throat> grand spiral. So now if you were to fly your machine, say a hundred light years, maybe, or a hundred thousand light years, you could fly from the side looking at the edge and come over the top. And then you would be looking down like you're looking at a plate flat, you know, as you're looking at a plate of food on the table. So this is a, was a great sight. I mean, it's very faint and you have to concentrate for quite some time to get the detail to pop into view. Uh, I did adjust the levels a little and uh, to get a little more separation between the arms. It was a little bit more hazed, I guess you would call it. So, but this is what it would look like. And uh, this is 20 or 57 million light years, 57 million light years away. Uh, pretty far. Yeah. It's a beautiful galaxy, though. I mean, when Charles Messier was hunting these, he probably had a few favorites. I'm sure this was one. You know what I love is the way these galaxies, they get a bar in them. And then it, it creates like a yin and a yang almost. The way it separates the, the core, it, there's a divide. And you have your left and your right side and they spiral. And um, it creates that eye shape. And you'll notice that in a few galaxies, uh, they have that similar structure in them. And typically it's associated with the bar, barred spirals. This was uh, from our trip, Scott. Right. Mount Wilson. Mm -hmm. Now this will give you an idea. That telescope will show you this kind of detail on the best nights. Yeah. And uh, it, you don't see this even in a, in the Mirko's 32 inch, you get hints of it. I mean, it's, it's really good view. We do get the same detail, but it's not as pronounced like this. So we had the pleasure of looking through Edwin Hubble's tool to look at these planetary nebulas. Yeah. And uh, it is just something to behold the structures. You know, each one is a little bit different depending on the way it exploded and uh, where the energy was released. You know, some of them are released at the equatorial. Most are the poles because the pole is the weakest point of the magnetic field. So typically when it lets loose, it's going to go through the weak spots. And once that happens, it's... I think once the star converts to cobalt, you better run. It's like a predator when it, you know, he laughs. <laughs> what the heck are you? And that boom, man, that, that would be scary to, yeah, to yeah. feel this. Like Beetlejuice is getting ready to go. I keep seeing on YouTube, NASA just announced that Beetlejuice exploded. But I, I don't think it did yet. But I mean, can you imagine when that does? What a great sight we're going to have. We won't need street lights for a few months. It'd be like a full moon all the time. So here's a comparison. I did a comparison of Mercos in my view that we have at Mount Pinos on good nights. And this is what I get. This is a sketch. It's a little more subdued, less detail, um, more 
just faint, you know, because of the aperture. And, you know, the bigger the aperture, the more photons you can pull in. For me, uh, the true absorption of photons, because photons is what's out there. That's really what's in space is the photons. They're just floating around. But when, when they come from a source, you know, they're directed. You can look right into them and um, connect. You know, it, it is some kind of a energy, but very faint. So I recommend you do astronomy every night if you can to get these photons. It will help you a lot. Two ad streetlights is killing my, my viewing. <laughs> now, this is, uh, again, Mount Wilson. This one we've seen, I'm using this for comparison purposes. You know, the structure of every planetary nebula is different. Uh, the forces are far beyond anything you could imagine uh, in Mother Nature. It's just on such a scale that you just couldn't imagine. It'd be like a bull hitting somebody blindsiding. Them. You just, you wouldn't even but times a trillion. So that's the Wilson look. And we had a good view. It was, this is a little bit more done, of course. I've had a couple of years. How long was it since we went? Two years, a year. Uh, what I did with this now is I took the Wilson data that my sketch had and I combined it with our typical best visual view looking through Mirko's 32 inch and my 28 inch and the color and the hue when you look into it it's like an eye it's called the cat's eye nebula it's in the constellation draco and um they call it a cat's eye because it looks like a cat's eye sort of so I, this is one of my favorite objects to look at this is probably the best view you'll get on one of the best nights there's so much stuff around that blew out. And when you look at a photograph that's been taken of this object for say 200 hours or something, the whole outside has a shell and structure. It's just so faint that our eyes can't pick that up from that distance. Do you like this one, Scott? I do. This one is uh, the merger. I think this is one of the most realistic views this would probably be real close to what you would see at Mount Wilson mm -hmm. in the eyepiece. It looks very realistic. Thank you. Proud of this one. I, I just finished it. It took all week. I had to start on it Tuesday night just to get things rolling. These things take time, you know. Just think when they were created, how, how much time it took. Just the wave of a hand. Hmm. This is, this is a funny name. There's many names for a lot of these objects. Yeah. One of the names for this is the clown face, but I'm not joking here. This is actually the Eskimo Nebula. Yeah. And um, this is a real good one to look at as well. Now we were just getting the hints of structure and you can see the diffuse cloud that blew out and it made a nice spherical planetary. Yeah, so it was smaller pretty... telescopes, you just see that brighter inner circle. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger scopes will, sh I guess, show the um, that diffuse cloud. The 60 inch definitely shows that cloud. Yeah. Uh, this was, I think I incorporated some of the 60 inch into this one as well. I mean, that's what you look at when you go to Wilson, right? Planets, yep. lunar. Yes. The moon. When you look at the moon through the 60 inch, it's like nothing you could imagine. Uh, the resolution is just like so amazing to see that. You would think, what could you see on the moon? I had to throw this in because my plaque has the exact replica of Saturn on it. And we missed opposition. It was cloudy here tonight. I was going to try to set up the 2U cam and do a live thing, but it pretty much clouded out. Yeah, uh, this was my best, one of my better views. Mirko was with me. We've had views equivalent to this, and uh, we had shootouts. You know, 
there's a guy with an extremely good OGS uh, 16 inch carbon fiber trailer mounted telescope. It's absolutely amazing for a Cassegrain. And he was getting views that would blow your mind. But what I was getting were these white clouds on the bottom with the 28 that I've never really seen before. They actually looked like clouds, like cumulonimbus clouds. Look at the detail on that. Yeah, amazing. So this this was, uh, I have a sketch, this freehand sketch, but it's not nearly as precise. So I had to bring this into Procreate. And um, so what's nice about digital is you can do your sketches the easiest way if you're going to sketch uh, I would recommend using a small Rigel red light or Scott has little red lights. You need to have red light when you go to a star party. It's proper mm -hmm. etiquette or, or people will yell at you because they don't know how to be nice. Um, but if you're, you know, turning on your headlights with your high beams, uh, it, it is quite annoying. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have to have the tools of the trade, but you can sketch on white paper just standard eight by 11 copy paper or printer paper and, and a regular pencil. And you could use a blending stub, you know, paper stub and a, a couple different uh, pencils like a 2B, 4B, HB, just to get the basic and, and then, you know, check in with your light, make sure everything's looking good. And then later you can, you know, refine it, bring it into Procreate and, and go to work and really clean it up and make perfect you know pretty much in nature most of the edges are perfectly you know smooth so it's not like when you do a drawing and it's jagged line you have to really keep it precise to, to make it look real that's the idea behind it sure improves your um what you see your ability to see things you see so much more when you're sketching you train yourself to key on certain features using averted vision. And, you know, you have to take time, take time to look at this stuff. Don't just go to the eyepiece and say, that's it. I, I just saw it. You have to spend decent amounts of time on, on faint objects that are hundreds of light years away, uh, millions of light years away. And there we have my best little buddy, I have to always say hello. He's always with me. Mm -hmm. He's here now, Bosco. And imagine traveling to the time of Star Trek where I could actually be a Vulcan. <laughs> this is what I would look like. It's Brock. My That's name is great. Johnny Sprocket. <laughs> Johnny Sprocket, huh? <laughs> and I'm with uh, the Global Star Party and the Astronomical League, and the A stands for A Team. And this ah, is this nice. is the the place I want to be. <laughs> but, uh, so you know, and then they got the Space Force. That that's what I really. If I was in the military now, you know, I was a Marine, I would have joined the Space Force. Sure. That is such a great logo. And, and, a, and you know what they used? They used this emblem. They used the Star Trek emblem. I see. For the United States Space Force. I don't look too bad as a Vulcan. Yeah, it works. Thank you. Well, that is my presentation. John, so, thank you so much, man. Thank you. It no, it was great. great. And informative. Thank you very much. Yep. That's Thank what you. we want to do is uh, teach them, teach people, let them know, you know, what, what it is actually going on. And, and it's mind blowing to think that we are all of us. If you've ever looked through a telescope, you're a time traveler. You've, uh, you should get the award. Everybody should have a medal. I've traveled back in time, you know, that's right. What's the, what's the farthest you've been back? Oh. Quasars? Quasars, yeah, 3C273 with uh, my 16-inch um, uh, telescope. 
Okay. Wow. So it's, I guess, about 3 billion light years, something like that. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, like, How do you even see it's the like light? like a faint blue star is what it looks like. So it's amazing. It's amazing. So, John, uh, you uh, have introduced me to uh, Mirko Mayer, okay? He's a good friend of yours. My observing um, so I'm gonna partner. I'm going to let you introduce him, okay? Uh, okay. Yeah. And so let's bring uh -oh. Mirko on here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you the greatest story about this. So we're at one of the biggest star parties with uh, some of the most serious guys on the mountain. I call them the Fabulous Four, which is uh, – Don Penzak. We all know Don Penzak. Yeah. Eyepieces, et cetera. And uh, by the way, he carries your eyepieces because we he sells them at the mountain. And I see. But, and then we're always using those 98 degrees from Jerry, huh, Mirko? Yep. Incredible mm -hmm. views. So we're up there one night and I'm going, why is this guy here? We all got Dobbs, some of the best. Jerry has a 22. I have a 28. And Don Penzak has one of the finest 12 and a half tier telescopes. It's probably the best 12 and a half I've looked through, but um, it's Don Penzak. You would expect no less. So we're doing intricate uh, lists, just going for obscure stuff. And uh, I asked Jerry, who's this guy with this little refractor over here? I mean, I think that he doesn't really fit. And um, so we're doing our observing and Mirko comes over. He goes, Hey, John, do you, do you want to see a picture I took? I go with that. Yeah, I guess. And when he showed me Andromeda galaxy, it absolutely mm. was mind blowing with that telescope. It's just like Caesar's uh, similar size. I, which one was that uh, 90 or 60? It was a, uh, it was the 70 millimeter William optic. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that, when he showed me those pictures in the veil, he kind of blew me away. So yeah. I, I might've become the odd man out after that, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we've, uh, through the scopes, you know, I got him looking through my 28 and he was always so nice. Uh, he used to go up there with his daughter and she still did. Had, they had a little red Coulter daub and they would always come and look. Awesome. And, and I, I kind of, I didn't know him that long, but I've kind of seen him grow up into, man, he's quite a person, uh, amazing astrophotographer, uh, incredible father, really great friend, a dynamic observing partner. Okay. <laughs> and we killed it. And we went out to Rodeo, New Mexico and drove and picked up his 32 inch. Oh, I'll so, talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Let me let you go to Mirko Mayer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to share on this uh, Global Star Party number 129. So thanks, Scott. It's a Thank it's an honor to be part of this and uh, what you have going since you've started the pandemic. I know I've tuned in on uh, the after, you know, after live. Um, yeah. So um, I did prepare a, uh, a set of slides that I'll go ahead and share. Um, let me see if I can go ahead and do that. Mirko. Yeah. That was a good new moon we had, wasn't it, last month? It was. We looked at a lot of galaxies. Okay. <laughs> can everybody see my screen? Can you see my screen, Scott? Uh, yes. Uh, it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, I'll go ahead and... You click here yep, now. That's it. Great. So just, uh, yeah, just what I thought I would share is um, just taking some photos of some image, sharing some images of uh, some galaxies that I've taken with longer focal length of large aperture versus a smaller aperture. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Hopefully won't bore you uh, for 10 minutes too much, but I'll just get start with a little bit of a background of myself. My name is Mirko Mayer, and I am uh, an engineer by trade. So I, I basically design facilities that transport and treat water. So every time you drink out of the tap or flush your toilet, you can thank people like us. <laughs> so, very, very critical to our society. Yeah. 
So, so my, my interest in astronomy began in 1986 at the age of 12, and that was when Halley's Comet visited. So it was around 1986, 87. Um, I don't know if I thought of, I've heard somebody talk about their first telescopes. My first telescope was this three inch Tasco reflector. Mm -hmm. And I'll never, ever forget the moment I got up at 3.30 a.m., set up my telescope to look at a red object low in the horizon and lo and behold there was saturn and its rings i just could not believe it it was <laughs> it was yeah. like you could reach out and touch it but you know it was in that telescope it is so small um I, I as a 12 year old kid i was setting up in the neighborhood and showing my neighbors and they wouldn't believe me they said oh come on kid you have some sort of kaleidoscope thing going on so after that, I got my first real telescope. My grandparents and my parents pitched in on a 10-inch reflector. It was a Coulter Odyssey, and that's the telescope that John was uh, talking about. Um, as a kid, um, I was I was uh, camping with my father, and we had chased dark skies. Um, my father's no longer with us, but you know I have him to thank for nurturing this hobby of mine that has been so rewarding and inspiring and humbling. And that's my daughter there at the age of probably around 12 or 11, standing next to that telescope that I had since I was a 12 year old kid. Wow. So I took a 10 year hiatus and I had that thing put away and I was using it intermittently until I started taking that, that scope out with my daughter on camp trips to enjoy the night sky mm -hmm. is being in a, you know, a, a it just fit in the car. That was the first compact. Uh, I guess that was a, a go-to, a compact uh, a telescope to fit in the trunk of the car for its size. It was pretty amazing. Um, you had to rely on maps and star hopping. We had amazing views, but, you know, because it wasn't go-to, you had to kink your back and your neck and you're looking at that, you know, by the end of the night, your neck and your back hurts. But it was my beloved scope for almost 30 years. And then when I started getting back up to Mount Pinos at these star parties around night 2013, you know, I start seeing people bringing up their larger telescopes and I won't mention any names, but, you know, people would bring in their 20 inch telescopes. I am the king. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed, you know, telescopes and equipment got substantially better in the amount of time that I was a little bit dormant from my hobby, my childhood hobby. So my quest for more aperture had had begun. So why astrophotography me? Well, I wanted to capture images of what I viewed and I really appreciated what Ron had mentioned earlier that he, he takes images of things that he views to share. And I started my astrophotography hobby in 2014. I got a, a 10 inch Newtonian on a German equatorial mount and I was using DSLR cameras before switching to cooled astro cameras. And I still chase those remote, remote dark skies. And that's, this is a picture here in the Mojave with me and my setup, my first, my first astrophotography rig. Um, my ability became okay at imaging while maintaining a level of uh, sanity with the, you know, the steep learning curve that this hobby has with all the associated gear, the mounts, the cameras, the processing. Um, I have a, a host of images uh, on Astro Bin that I share that you could see a progression of, of some, you know, my images did get better, but I'm not uh, um, by no means a, a, a perfection or, or, or award-winning astrophotographer. I just do it mainly for myself and um, just to share images with my friends and whatnot and with other people who are interested. Um, as my ability got better, I compared various tubes and cameras with imaging friends that were also on the astro imaging hobby path. Um, my friend, Alex Roberts, who uh, is an amazing astrophotographer, um, we compared, we both had a 10 inch uh, reflector Newtonian setup and we compared our cameras. So let's, you take a picture with yours using your Pentax and I'll take a picture with mine. Let's see what it looks like. And so we would, this here uh, image of Rosetta Nebula, which is the heart of the Rosetta Nebula, um, it, it's a beautiful star cluster with surrounding gas um, that had formed those stars. I had also compared various lenses um, using a Pentax camera with a 300 millimeter uh, lens and the Red Cat 51. So that was really like, hey, if you have an awesome lens in your 
your camera set, your camera bag, do you really need a, you know, a, a 70 millimeter refractor to be attached? Can you get by with whatever you have? And chances are you may be able to get by and take a really cool photo of the night sky as long as you have your know, tracking ability. But I enjoyed doing both observational astronomy and astrophotography, and I would often have both setups in the field. So um, I eventually did upgrade that Red Coulter Odyssey telescope to an Explorer Scientific 16-inch daub that's pictured here, set up with my um, my astro, my usual astro imaging rig. Can we talk about that daub for a minute? We can, but hold on, <laughs> we can. But it did the a little quality bit, yeah. of that mirror, we have to tell them. Yeah, yeah, we it's 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 been an amazing telescope. We're not, you know, it's an amazing telescope. I have mine equipped with the DSC. Um, uh, uh, a digital setting circles and it's just been a, a great uh, telescope i've had it for 10 years and there's my daughter again standing next to my scope 10 years later and now she's college bound so eventually fast forward to 2020 um i wanted i was getting curious and i wanted to you know see what it would be like to hook up my camera equipment to one of these larger dobs and during an observing session with john i asked him if it would be okay to hook up some gear to his 28 inch Dobsonian and I asked if I took a 180 second exposure in my nine and a quarter Celestron, what would that exposure be in a large 28 inch tracking dog? What, how many seconds would I have to take um, of this exposure with the same camera settings um, if it was hooked up to a large dog? So I did a little research and found that in order to figure that out, you need to figure out a couple exposure factors to get an equivalent exposure. And I hope I don't bore too many people with some numbers here, but um, you need to figure out two things, your focal ratio exposure factor and an aperture exposure factor. So the first factor is focal ratio. So if I, if I take pictures with my C9 and a quarter, my focal ratio is F10. Using John's telescope as an example, his focal ratio is 4.33. So the ratio of the two ratios is about 2.3 so 2.3 times faster he collects light 2.3 times faster in his 28 inch scope just based on his focal ratio the other factor that we need to calculate is the aperture so that's just basically what's the ratio of the areas of the two apertures so i'm shooting through a nine and a quarter celestron tube as an example if we were to use John's scope, his 28 inch, we end up with a square inch area. You know, we're not factoring or accounting in the center of obstruction, but his the area of his mirror is 615 square inches, mm -hmm. where in a C9 and a quarter, it's 67 square inches. Mm -hmm. So that aperture factor is nine times more light gathering ability in John's scope. So his scope would have his, he's collecting photon, photons, sorry, that have, that have started, you know, 30 million light years away or whatever. He's collecting photons nine times faster or, or more abundant at the same rate. So he will have more photons in, per second than I would have photons in my, my sensor. So we decided, given the opportunity, we'd put it to the test and we hooked up my camera and we, lo and behold, we got, um, well, actually we we calculated what this is. So to calculate the equivalent exposure in a 180 second photo, say if I was taking a 180 second exposure in my C9 and a quarter, um, I would need 180 seconds divided not by nine, which is the aperture factor, and then divided by 2.3, which is the focal ratio factor. I would need a, an exposure of about nine seconds. And if I was taking a, an exposure of five, uh, five minutes in my C9 and a quarter, that equivalent exposure in John's scope would be about 15 seconds or 14 and a half seconds. So we basically said, we should do this. Let's hook up my camera to your scope and try to get 15 second subs. And so we put that to the test. And this is what one of our results was right here that I'm sharing. This is the Eagle Nebula, which is also what hosts the famous Hubble Pillars of Creation. I'm sure John is. Had Could I show my insert in between real quick after you tell your story about it? Sure. <clears throat> this was an image that we used 
10 second exposures and I hooked up two cameras, a, a H alpha camera and a color camera. And uh, we combined a total integration for this image of about 15 minutes. And I did the processing on this. It wasn't, um, you know, wasn't by means, any means perfect. There are people that can pixel people all, all day and, and come up with some things. Nothing's ever perfect in astrophotos, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but this was a good, good uh, test for us to, uh, to work on, you know. And what it ultimately happened, a year and a half later, it inspired me to get a larger <laughs> telescope. <laughs> so I, I went out and got a 32-inch Dobson wow. screen telescope. <laughs> he smashed me into oblivion. I've been so, destroyed. <laughs> I see uh, Robert sharing an image of, of his. It's it's a beautiful, the beautiful image of uh, the pillars of creation, the Eagle Nebula. There, it's awesome. Um, so what I'm going to share now is just some um, <coughs> photos of side by side of various rigs that I've taken pictures with of galaxies, and just it's kind of mind blowing how amazing or how quickly you can get photos um, to be equivalent. So. Here's a picture of M5, M1, sorry, M101 that I took with the 32 inch daub. And on the left hand side is a 32 inch daub with 15 minutes of integration. I believe I was taking 20 second subs. And on the right side, um, I, it was three hours to get that photo using, I think it was 180 seconds through my C9 and a quarter. Mm. Obviously this isn't a, a a comparison these are images that i took maybe years apart so but they look different but the, i'm getting a lot of light gathering ability in in the large in the large telescope yeah this next uh object here is m51 which is 28 million light years away on the left i took 10 second subs through the 32 inch and on the right i took 180 second subs so much more resolution. Yeah, it's it's quite quite remarkable. Here's a really cool. I know we've been talking about time and space and distance. Yeah. I'm not sure if anybody's shared this, but one of my favorite analogies to understanding distance is is the uh, Earth and Sun at a one inch scale apart. So. If the earth and sun are, if you scale the earth and sun down so that they're one inch apart, one light year is going to be one mile away at that scale. Wow. So when we're talking about imaging a galaxy 28 million light years away, it, using a scale of the earth and sun one inch apart, that galaxy is 28 million miles away. <laughs> the, the reason why that no, one inch it's hard to the, wrap your head around that yeah the reason why that one inch scale works is because by an amazing coincidence there are 65,000 astronomical units in a light year which is the distance from earth to sun and there is guess what 65,000 inches in a mile. So when you put the earth and sun one inch apart, you can get a relative, you know, a, a kind of mind model of what a, what a light year is. So these galaxies that we're taking pictures of are 28 million miles away in a one inch earth sun scale, which is 28 million Astros. years. How many astronomical units is that? <laughs> yeah. A lot. Yeah, it's it's uh, sixty five thousand times 28 20, 28 million. Yeah. So this next image here is oh, actually, this is just for some perspective. So here, this is present day. This is the first image of M fifty one, which was taken in the year of eighteen eighty nine by Isaac Roberts. And it was through a 20 inch scope and that involved four and a half hours of manual guiding. He needed to do that in four and a half hours. And I wish I had 
to share, but I have a friend, his name is Puya, and he took an amazing photo of M51 just using his camera and his telephoto lens and super and stacking a bunch of short exposures. And I wish I could share that with you right now, but it's really quite remarkable because it just speaks to how much technology has improved and just what you can do with today's technology. It's quite remarkable. So I did the same thing with the M106. On the left is eight minutes of integration and on the right is one and a half hours. One, one of my favorite objects to view through, and John knows this one well, um, Don't is say it. <laughs> NGC 891. Uh, 32 million light years away. I took this photo with two different um, setups and uh, two hours on one side, 11 minutes on the other side. And we all love the deer lick. Um, another 12 minute, 30 second subs on the left side. One hours, three, five minute subs on the right side. 32 million light years away or 32 million years ago. Wow. And then last, I don't have a comparison, but this is uh, one of my favorite galaxies to view through a telescope. You can see this on any, in, in many modest telescopes, eight inches, uh, you don't need really large aperture to view this with your eyes, but you could see this and it reminds me, this galaxy reminds me of, reminds me of our own galaxy. Um, we're seeing another galaxy, 39 million light years away, edge on, and it, it reminds me of viewing our own Milky Way. Uh, those dust lanes, I mean, it just makes it look 3D. Yeah. Beautiful. So what, what are my, uh, what did I, what are my conclusions of imaging through a large scope? Uh, you know, there's, it's not easy transporting a large aperture telescope for imaging. Um, it takes away from the time you can enjoy and share the views with your very own eyes looking through the telescope. Um, so it's, it, one thing about large aperture is you really want to use it to look through it is my finding and you don't need, um, aperture really to take a great photo. You, I'm just so impressed with what people are doing. All these images, I could never process the way that I'm seeing these amazingly skilled astrophotographers and what they do nowadays. It's just incredible. Um, the pros is I've taken some of my personal best high focal length images with it. So of galaxies, I've, I, I've taken some really, I'm really happy with them. They're the best photos I've taken personally, my personal best. And you can image many galaxies in a short amount of time. If we were to just devote a night to capturing galaxies on, on a sensor, um, we, could, we could cover a lot of ground. And so with that, that's the end of my uh, talk. Um, I really appreciate Marco, Scott for you. having me. Thank you. Yeah, well, you are welcome back anytime. Um, beautiful images and uh, can I? Um, I like your I like your analogy of the uh, one inch scale. You know, it's uh, it's great. I, I will steal that. Oh, please do because I was I was it really I really when I read it I read it in the uh, what's the uh, the three volume book I can't even believe I'm having a oh, brain Burnham's Burnham. handbook Burnham's I read it in Burnham's and that's how okay. Burnham's explained it. Yeah, and it it was really it hit me. I never never gonna forget what it. What a fabulous. <laughs> What a fabulous set, you know, I mean, hey. all, all the inspiration that came from Burnham's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's so much more information today, but it would be very hard to beat the inspiration of what Burnham's put forth in that work. So I keep those books with me at every star party. They're in my trailer ready to go. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's some of these things you want to see obscure stuff. You go back to the charts and really start to go through them. There's, there's a lifetime of objects. You know, what Mirko accomplished in, and when he discovered, you know, just running the numbers, we had been up all night and um, we were jazzed to give it a shot. And our first shot was so amazing. And it was just a test. Mirko's the most amazing astrophotographer. He doesn't give himself credit. You know, that picture won the second A pot of the day. That was all you, Mirko. I, it was just 
my scope, man, but I owe you the credit for mine. I'd like to show this uh, if I could. I want to show you Hubble's picture, what Mirko did. If I could uh, get in there real quick, Mirko. Oh, stop sharing? Okay. Oh, well, no, I think uh, Scott does that, right, Scott? I, I can do it or you can do it, uh, Mirko. Wait. This is uh, what Mirko accomplished. And, and uh, the picture through his 32 was even deeper. So we're going to try to put ourselves both together and uh, see if we can make this uh, a real effort, give it our best shot. So I'm ready to go? Yeah. Good. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me bring you on. Go ahead. I'm going to just add the two of them because uh, one of them I processed to match our, our image. So, yeah, we, we were uh, pretty impressed with the result of uh, what Mirko had achieved. I, I was. I mean, for, for using a big scope, it's absolutely amazing that we could um, achieve that. Wouldn't you say, Mirko? Oh, he, he's up. He turned out. Yeah, he's muted. Oh, yeah. It's we have it's when you're using aperture, you should certainly what I've learned is, you know, you, it really uh, you really can short your exposure, shorten your exposures. I was uh, I want to maybe close with the music. Oh, uh, this is it. I wanted to show Mirko's scope. OK, so this is an idea. This is Hubble, right? The pillars. As you can see, it's very sharp. Of course, this is my, that's my dream. <laughs> you know, if you want to visualize yourself in, in the universe, you know, the power of manifestation, you have to visualize yourself in, in the big scope. So potentially I see myself with it. I could get it. That's Hubbled again. Okay. Um, let me go back. I got to I got to get our picture. It's tough to differentiate oh. when when you're um when you're um looking from a distance. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. There sure, it this is. is. That's this it. This is Mercos. Look at that. From here on Earth hmm. with a 28-inch telescope. Yep. It's it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yes. Beautiful. I, I was extremely okay. So now I wanted to share my screen. I'm going to see if I can finally play the closing song. <laughs> Here we go. Come on, baby. Give it to me. This one has stumped me for eons. And I don't know if it's going to work. So this is not copyrighted music, right? Uh, yeah, you, is, you don't want to. No, yeah, no, no, no. You don't want to play it. Nope, it's they'll, not. They'll, they'll cut the stream. Nope, this is actually um, free. Okay. From uh, it's it's on my Samsung. They put the music. They're they're just uh, synthetic music. Uh, and you do it to the song, and that's what I've been doing. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so let me see if – so you can see everything now? I see the pillars there. Yeah. Okay, good. Wait. I'm going to find – I'm going to see if I can get my song finally. Please give it to me. <laughs> It's so frustrating. I have got to figure this out because I've been skunked every time. You know, when I, when I do the um, simulated version, oh, there it is. Okay, let's see. Can you hear it?
Cloud Pictures. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. the presentations. Um, I don't know who else is uh, back there. I see that Robert Wilmore is still checked in. And Mirko and John, thank you, the three of you, uh, for those pres presenters that are out there watching on YouTube uh, with the audience. Thank you for your uh, great work today. Uh, I want to thank the audience for uh, participating uh, from around the world. Um, We've got uh, guys all the way from the UAE to uh, um, down in uh, South America and around North America as well. Um, and uh, uh, it's great to uh, it's great to have everyone here. Um, let me bring this in gallery view. You can see everyone that's still yeah. with us. Um, and we'll be back next Tuesday uh, with the 130th Global Star Party. So um, uh, the uh, theme is uh, to be determined. Um, for the 131st Global Star Party, which I'll t tell you about already, uh, it's called the Voyager Effect. And uh, uh, Linda, Dr. Linda Spilker, who took Ed Stone's position as heading up the Voyager missions, okay, is going to be on with us. Uh, she is from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She is, uh, they are still flying, controlling the Voyager spacecraft, which both took off in 1977. So um, it's going to be fantastic to have her on. Uh, Linda arrived at JPL uh, fresh out of, out of uh, the university. Uh, she interned at JPL and uh, her, one of her first uh, projects was the Voyager mission itself. So she worked alongside Carl Sagan and the original people that were involved in, with Voyager. So uh, I think it's fantastic that uh, we have this opportunity. And um, of course, if you're uh, so uh, inclined um, and you have uh, um, an idea of how the Voyager missions have affected you, uh, we'd love to have you on Global Star Party. So, um, okay. Well, I'm going to. Uh, do we? What do we have here, Robert? He's he's showing us something right now. Let's bring him on. Robert, do the eagle. Oh, is that live? Amazing. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm just sharing some space photos. Space photos. <laughs> no, it's not live. Not live. Well. Robert, thank you very much for for bringing us some live views. Uh, Eagle, you said. Hang on, let me find yeah, it. Yeah, Eagle. Oh yeah, thank you. Oh, the other name for it is the Star Queen. The Star. Queen. There you go. Wow. What what very size nice. instrument did you use? It's a reflector. This is with a ten-inch Dobsonian. Oh, very nice. Really? Wow. Sorry, what was that? Sonian photo. Very good. Incredible. Nice pinpoint stars. Yeah. yeah I was going to see if I could find the photo. Oh, there it is. So there's the 10 inch on the uh, G11. Oh, is I see. A, is that a parallax tube? The uh, tube looks like a metal parallax instruments tube. Uh, no, this is a, just an equatorial. Over here is a two telescopes. Mm -hmm. And this is on an LX-65 dual saddle. Yep. Fantastic. I'm sure you get long lines waiting to 
look through those telescopes. Yeah, that's all I got. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, a little video you for all. you guys to watch about. Oh, no, I love your photos. Yeah. Before I we uh, shut it down, and um, uh, there's also a uh, the guys from the Winter Star Party sent us a little commercial, which I'll play as well. So, um, but uh, thanks again, thanks to everybody, and uh, as uh, my friend Jack Korkheimer used to say, keep looking up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. OSIRIS-REx is NASA's first asteroid sample return mission. It launched in September 2016 on a journey to explore a near-Earth asteroid called Bennu. After arriving in 2018, OSIRIS-REx spent nearly two years orbiting Bennu, mapping and studying its rugged terrain before carrying out its primary science objective. On October 20, 2020, the spacecraft ventured to a small crater in the asteroid's northern hemisphere. It dodged jagged rocks and towering boulders and plunged its arm into the loose surface, excavating six tons of debris while collecting about 250 grams of material. OSIRIS-REx stowed its bounty and closed its sample return capsule. It bid farewell to Bennu in May 2021, embarking on a 1.2 billion mile cruise back to Earth. Now, two years and four months after leaving Bennu, OSIRIS-REx is closing in on the place where its journey began. On September 24th, the spacecraft will approach to nearly 63,000 miles from Earth. It will power up and release its sample return capsule at 4.42 a.m. Mountain Time. The capsule must be jettisoned within a narrow time frame and at just the right angle to hit its target, an area of roughly 250 square miles in Utah's West Desert. Once the capsule is away, OSIRIS-REx will fire its thrusters to avoid colliding with Earth. At 8.42 a.m., the capsule will streak into the atmosphere at a blistering 27,000 miles per hour. It will race across the western U.S. and begin to glow with heat, allowing infrared trackers on the ground to chart its progress. As it pushes deeper into the atmosphere, the capsule will rapidly decelerate, subjecting the Bennu samples to a punishing 32 Gs. About two minutes after entry, it will slow to Mach 1.4 and deploy its drogue parachute, stabilizing its descent. The capsule will enter special use airspace at 8.46 a.m., almost 10 miles above the Department of Defense Utah Test and Training Range. Radar stations will lock on and track it to within 30 feet of its landing site. At 8.50 a.m., the capsule will extract and deploy its main parachute one mile above the ground. It will make its final descent at a leisurely 11 miles per hour, like a marathon runner savoring a victory lap, before touching down in the desert soil at 8.55. After ground teams retrieve the capsule, the Bennu samples will be taken to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. The sample canister will be opened in the Astro Materials Acquisition and Curation Facility, and the samples will be curated, distributed, and studied for decades to come. Having delivered its cargo, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft will depart Earth, but its journey will not quite be finished. In a daring encore, the renamed OSIRIS Apex will enter an elliptical orbit of the Sun, repeatedly passing within the orbit of Venus and pushing the limits of its thermal design. Beginning in 2029, it will chase down and investigate Apophis, a 1,200-foot stony asteroid destined to make an exceptionally close flyby of Earth. After 13 years in deep space, at the start of a new decade alone on a new world, the journey will continue. Come one, come all to the Southern Cross Astronomical Society's 2024 Winter Star Party, celebrating 40 years of stargazing, happening from February 5th through the 11th, 2024, on Scout Key in the beautiful Florida Keys. 
Get away from the cold and adjust your latitude underneath the pristine skies of Southern Florida with breathtaking views of Eta Carina, the Jewel Box, the Southern Cross, Centaurus A, and of course, the magnificent Omega Centauri. Tickets will go on sale on or about October 1, 2023 at SCAS.org. See you there. So it's a beautiful sunny day and uh, we have uh, uh, you know, our refractor out and I've got my eclipse glasses on and I've got my safe solar filter. Of course the eclipse is not here yet, but um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you some things about uh, solar filter safety. Uh, the filters that we use is the highest uh, ISO standards. Um, and uh, in, actually independently tested by us as well. So just to make sure that those standards are met. So if you're going to use a telescope to look at the partial phases, and part, the, let me underline partial phases to you. You use eclipse glasses to observe the sun in partial phases when it's uh, in total, if you're gonna be on the path of totality, you can take the glasses off, and only during that time can you directly look up at where the sun is, because it's completely blocked out. You'll see the corona, you'll see you know, lots of really cool effects that will they'll leave you speechless. But during all the partial phases, you have to have safe solar filtration. So, how do you do it uh, properly? Uh, let me show you. First off, let's show you what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do is put on eclipse glasses and look through the telescope that's unfiltered. Uh, and I'll show you exactly why here. We're going to point the telescope directly at the sun. And right now, we have sunlight coming right through the eyepiece. Um, you know, can turn that up a little bit. If you use solar glasses and look right at the filter material, you see it's already burning, it's burning a hole right through the solar filter material. That is how powerful a telescope is. You can now see that there is a hole through there, and that could be your eye. So this is what can happen if you think that you can use eclipse glasses to look through unfiltered telescopes or binoculars. If you do that, uh, the sun's energy is going to burn right through the filter and burn right into your eye. So if you're going to use a telescope or a pair of binoculars to watch the partial phases of a total eclipse or just to observe the sun to look for sunspots or something like that, uh, make sure that you are using an over-the-lens solar filter that has the uh, proper ISO safety rating and all of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this filter on. It's, uh, you can see how snugly it's fitting here. This is not about to come off. Uh, uh, but. Uh, you know, if you have a loose fitting filter, use tape. Do anything that you can to make sure that the filter is not going to come off. Um, and then the, the other thing is, too, is that uh, finder scopes, um, uh, optical finder scopes are like little telescopes, and they need to be filtered as well. In this case, I just have a red dot finder. There is no um, magnifying power to it, so I'm not going to use it to sight the sun in. The way I'm going to sight in the sun is literally as I'm, I'm going to look down at the shadow and align the scope up so I'm getting the smallest shadow possible of the telescope as it's hitting the ground. And now I can safely look at the sun in comfort and look at sunspots and if we have partial phases going on in the eclipse I'll see them all. Are your eclipse glasses safe for looking at the sun? Let's check to see if your eclipse glasses can handle the heat or if they need to stay inside. First off, never check your eclipse glasses with the sun. That's a good way to injure your eyes. Take your eclipse glasses and find a bright light, like a lamp or a flashlight. Hold your eclipse glasses up to the light and look through them. The light will appear extremely dim or not appear at all when looking through the glasses. For example, you should only be able to see the filament of a light bulb, but not the glow surrounding the bulb. Also, if your eclipse glasses have any marks or scratches on them, don't use them. If you have older eclipse glasses from a previous eclipse, give them the check to make sure they haven't been damaged or scratched. All safe eclipse glasses will meet the ISO 12312-2 standard. It's best to store eclipse glasses in a safe place where they won't become scratched or punctured. 
Remember, never look at the sun without eclipse glasses or a solar filter. Be safe and happy sun viewing, everyone.